Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and I'd like to welcome you to our 18th livecast, which is dedicated to another exceedingly important topic of our times, namely that of trust in the democratic process. This is a vast subject, so we will necessarily take a focused view by examining it through the identity lens. This is also our season two finale, ID for Africa livecasts will not be broadcast over the summer, so we can focus on several important projects, including the annual needs assessment to inform the ID for the agenda, as well as our programming for the third season starting in September, and our physical meeting, which we are now targeting for June 2022. So stay tuned over the summer for exciting updates and new content. Back to today's session. By definition, identity management is at the heart of representative democracy and is essential for the one person, one vote principle and for verifying eligibility to vote based on age and legal status. In many African countries where significant number of people are undocumented in civil registers, biometrics have been used for the last 20 years for the identification, registration, the duplication of roles, and even for the verification of voters on the day of elections. By providing a credible line of defense against identity fraud, biometrics have been credited with enhancing public trust and in limiting disputes and post-election violence, which had plagued the continent in the early days of democracy. No country in the world should consider itself immune from allegations of electoral fraud and post-election violence as we have seen with the insurrection of January 6th of this year in the USA, which was the result of claims of election fraud linked to alleged identity mismanagement. So constructing electoral processes, which in the eyes of the public cannot be undermined by political claims of voter fraud, is one of the highest priorities of electoral management bodies, or EMBs, not just in Africa, but around the world. This is certainly one of the subjects that we will address in today's session, where we will hear from frontline EMB practitioners from South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and Guinea about how they have succeeded to instill public confidence and deliver what the observers consider as legitimate elections through sound identity management practices. We will also get a Pan-African perspective on the continent's overall progress in this regard from one of the most respected expert NGOs and election observers, as well as from industrial innovators. But the plot is thicker than just putting in place robust identification practices for elections. These processes must be done without friction or barriers or else risk disenfranchising voters. While best practices for how to combat identity fraud in elections are now clear, it is still possible that elections could be manipulated through the exclusion of certain groups from access to the identification documents needed for registration or for voting. ID for Africa supports robust identification measures in elections if and only if they are accompanied by an honest political will to franchise everyone. Our mantra of no one left behind and our commitment to total inclusion is just as primordial here as it is in any other domain where identity plays a role. Combating fraud while ensuring transparent, inclusive practices is a topic we will explore in today's episode, but it's only one of the many challenges EMBs face today. There are at least three additional broad challenges that have emerged recently. First, it is clear that the way EMBs interact with voters is changing as people's expectations for how they receive services are evolving, especially young adults. Franchising the new generation is a high priority of the EMBs, but it requires innovative changes in traditional business processes. This generation is accustomed to digital by design, they interact through mobile devices, and they conduct their business online and remotely with speed and on the move. To appeal to them, there is a need for a natively digital identity, which can be leveraged through mobile and online platforms to allow for remote voter registration or other interactions, including in the future, mobile or online voting. The emergence of digital identity has implications to the future of voting, as we shall explore today. 
Second, electoral processes have yet to successfully resolve the tension that is emerging between the need for transparency of the electoral rolls and the privacy of voter data. As the rolls move into digital form and they become available online, political data mining is becoming a very active domain and data consulting firms are popping up everywhere. They analyze and aggregate different sources of data to create granular and information rich profiles that threaten privacy in ways we've never seen before. Here we see a fundamental incompatibility between the laws that require EMBs to share the certified electoral roles with political parties and the nascent data protection laws that are being adopted across Africa. This is another topic that we will address in today's episode. Third, it should not escape anyone that we are living through a major digital disruption impacting the way we receive information. It appears this trend has already been exploited for unfair gains in elections over the last five years, and it is expected to remain front and center in how political campaigning will be conducted going forward. This is an example of a force outside the EMB's control that will require a broader national debate on fair information practices and perhaps even new regulations. While we are not going to be able to address the topic of disinformation and fake news, which have dominated the public mind share in recent past, we will try to understand the role the digital identity plays in unfair information practices. We call this the selective dissemination of information and others call it micro-targeting. For example, using profile identity, social media platforms allow the delivery of different messages to different groups or even individuals. This is a departure from the broadcast model of information sharing where everyone receives the same information. We believe this selective information delivery is a major threat to the democratic process. It reminds us of the challenge that was faced in the investment world prior to the year 2000, or prior to the broad advent of the internet. At that time, companies were disclosing different information to different investors and shareholders, which led, which led to an atmosphere of privileged or insider trading and which threatened to undermine investor confidence. This is why the US Securities and Exchange Commission imposed in October 2000, the so-called Regulation Fair Disclosure, or Reg FD, Reg FD, which was implemented to stop publicly traded companies from selectively disclosing material information. Everybody had to have access to the same information. Selective disclosure became illegal. This should inspire important questions when we examine information flow in the context of electoral campaigns. Do we need the analog of Reg FD to govern information flow in political campaigns? What about the liability of platforms that are able to selectively disseminate information through micro-tagging as opposed to broadcasting? Are we in an era where the safe harbor that was given to them through Section 230 of the so-called Communication Decency Act in the USA and its inspired analogs, which are popping up in many African countries as we speak, would need to be re-examined through this lens? These questions are certainly on the agenda for today's episode, so stick around. We can keep going, but already you can see why democracy today is under diverse and serious threats. And I hope you can also see why today's episode should be considered among the most important sessions we have produced to date. What is at stake is not to be taken lightly. Certain applications of disruptive technologies are enabling nefarious forces outside the control of the EMBs to manipulate the democratic process. If left unopposed, this could lead to loss of public trust in elections. The trust that the EMBs have worked hard to instill through a combination of policy and technical means. We as the global identity community have a responsibility and an important role to play in the defense of democratic practices. Because to a certain extent, some of these forces rely on digital identity, data, and profiling to deliver their nefarious impact. If you wish, this is the dark side of identity, and we need to shed the spotlight on it to ensure that identity management can only contribute positively to democracy and its institutions. To help us navigate through this sensitive topic today, we have assembled an amazing panel of expert practitioners. 
I like to welcome, and in no particular order, Chidi Nawafor from the Independent National Electoral Commission, Nigeria. Sai Mamabolo from the Independent Electoral Commission in South Africa. Jinabu Kamara Toure from Commission Electorale Nationale Indépendante, Guinea. Michael Uma from the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, Kenya. Taune Mawanyeza from the Carter Center in Liberia. Amber Sinha from the Center for Internet and Society in India. Dr. Isaac Rutenberg and Grace Mutungo from the Center for IP and IT Law in Strathmore University, Kenya. Lucy Pourdon from the Privacy International. Lyle Laxton from the Laxton Group and Vincent Buatu from IDEMIA. Thank you for being with us today. We appreciate you taking the time to generously share your knowledge and experience on this important topic for the benefit of Africa and the world. Sincere thanks also go to our development partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Omidyar Network for the support in making the live cast possible and for keeping them commercial free. No financial or other consideration was received from anyone appearing in the live casts. Their presence on the panel is due to their merit and pertinence to the topic at hand. Before we start, I'd like to remind you that you as the audience can participate in the discussions in several ways. You can do the chat, but here I'd like to emphasize in big letters, I'd like to emphasize, you need to select panelists that ended attendees when sharing in the chat because the default for Zoom is just to go to the panelists. So you'll be missing out on the discussion. So when you do a chat, please use the drop down menu and select panelists that ended attendees so that people can uh, interact with you and not just the panelists. You can also participate in live poll. we polling. We'll have a couple of them today, two or three. Of course, if you will need a question, please put it in the Q&A and those will be attended to and directed to the panelists. And of course, the voice of the community. Community voices are very important. It's your way of joining the panel, um, raise your hand, an operator will prepare you to um, at be promoted to the panel, but please be responsive because as, as we select you, you need to turn on your, your video, okay? Um, to the community at large, please continue to be part of our community and help the movement disseminate high quality and unbiased content that can inform policy in Africa and elsewhere in the world. You can do this by being active in the live sessions and by sharing, liking, commenting, and subscribing to what we are producing together as digital public content that we're making available on our YouTube channel. Okay, now I'd like to start with the first panel, which is the panel of the electoral management bodies. Um, operator, I will, will put on pause the rest of the panelists and then we will welcome the, the four panelists from the electoral commissions. <clears throat> Greetings. Uh, thank you so much for, for being with us this morning. Um, I want to start with just getting, getting a warm up by um, uh, asking all of you to begin by sharing with us um, your identity management practices um, in, in the broadest terms possible. Um, Chidi, I will, I'll start with you because you, you've dealt with a bigger challenge than many in Africa. Um, your foundational system was not in place. So how did the INEC in Nigeria and how does the INEC in Nigeria manage the identity? How do you identify your voters? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know whether my... Internet is fluctuating a little bit, but if you can hear me, um, we can hear you. I will be okay, but I will be. I'll try as much as possible to explain the situation. Hopeful that you are hearing me, or mm -hmm. you can hear me. Um, for INEC, Independent National Electoral Commission. I 
I think yeah, we, we've 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 lost Chidi. Um, so maybe I'll I'll switch. Uh, operator, could you communicate with Chidi and let let him know that I'll I'll switch to uh, to Sai Sai. You're the different extreme. You've got a wonderful foundational system. So let, let's let's start with you. How does South Africa's IEC uh, identify its voters? Well, th thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Tick, and greetings to everybody. Uh, it's quite exciting uh, to be here this afternoon. In South Africa, we have a national population register, which is the civil uh, register which is held by the Department of Home Affairs. Mm -hmm. Voters role um, is a responsibility of the Electoral Commission. So you come and apply um, at the voting station or at the local office of the Electoral Commission. We collect your uh, identity number through a portable bar scanner unit. And we take that information and through an API, confirm a number of elements um, from the National Population Register. We confirm that your citizenship status, we confirm your age, and then based on those uh, outcomes, make a decision to place you on the voters role uh, or not. The first common voters role in South Africa was established in in 1998, at that point, we had 18.1 uh, million uh, South Africans. As we speak today, we have 25.7 uh, uh, million uh, people on, uh, on the voters' roll. So we do not take the biometrics, but the National Population Register does have the details of the uh, fingerprints of everybody who's on the um, national population register. So if right. you like, we, we, we are dependent really on the national population register is the foundational base upon which we uh, create the, the co national common voters role. Thank you. Right. So, so basically, um, this has the advantage that, that you immediately can verify their legal status and their age, because that is the, the type of uh, information that's already in the foundational system. So that's one advantage. The one disadvantage that somebody could criticize, and maybe you can answer that, um, what if somebody is not in the National Population Register? Uh, what is the process for franchising them? The, 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 the basic um, process is that you've, for you to assert your rights of citizenship, you first have got to be registered on the civil register. So without um, enlisting on the civil register, you can't have access to public yeah, amenities. Right. It's not only the right to vote, it's a right to open a bank account. You can't open a bank account if you don't have a, you're not on the civil register. Um, you can't access um, public health uh, programs and so on and so on. So for any person in South Africa to be able to vindicate their rights granted in terms of the constitution, the basis of that is through a uh, registration on the civil register. And the civil register, so you have to be there. And those are people, maybe they're adults, they have not been registered at birth, but the home affairs can register them biometrically and can validate them and give them a unique number that you rely on. Is that what the process would be? That, that's what the process would be. There's a, a, a late registration process. Um, okay. If you've not been registered at birth or within uh, the first month of your birth, there's a late registration process. It's a little bit more vigorous than a baby being born, uh, but there is right. still a regulated process for, uh, for, for late registration. For getting people in. Excellent. Okay, so hold on one second. I'm going to come back to you. Let's just get a perspective from Kenya. The IEBC, Michael. How does it? How do you identify? How do you manage the identity to identify your voters to put them on a voter roll? Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Uh, Kenya adopted uh, biometric uh, voter registration back in 2010 on a pilot basis. 
And then in 2012, they adopted it fully countrywide, uh, all the 290 constituencies. Um, at the registration center, a voter has to present himself with the national identity card issued by the government. Uh, this is to confirm the age and the citizenship to critical parameters. Our role is then to capture the voter, 10 fingerprints, the portrait, and store in our database. The purpose of cap capturing the fingerprints is to deduplicate, avoid those who register multiple times because it's not allowed. And uh, basically to make sure the register is as accurate as possible. So the commission stores uh, text data, that is the bi bi biographical, full names, date of birth, gender, and uh, the station where the voter is uh, expecting to vote in the next elections, together with the biometrics, the 10 fingerprints. Uh, during election, so the, the biometrics are for two purposes. First, to make sure every voter is uh, registered only once in the entire national register. And uh, two, for purposes of voting on election day, they, while presenting themselves before they are given the ballot papers to cast their ballot, they have to be identified biometrically to this is just to ensure that the register is accurate and that those who are voting are registered voters without relying on any other data. So in, uh, in brief, that is how voter registration and the okay. use of the biometrics is conducted in Kenya. Okay, so, so hold, hold on. Um, unlike South Africa, where South Africa relies on the foundational system, you actually rely on your own ID database, your own identification system, which is based on a, on a biometric. Um, was that because the foundational system was not ready for you or was it because you wanted to maintain a certain independence? What, what, what is the motivation for taking on that, that responsibility of, of creating an ID specific to elections? Thank you for the question. Uh, mm -hmm. Initially, we uh, relied on the national ID card number as a, what we assume to be a unique identifier, only to find out uh, years later that uh, the population and some voters who share ID numbers, exact one number shared by two or three different people. And this was acknowledged by the registrar of persons, in which case now the ID became and reliable. Secondly, there was fraud in that people could pick identity documents which got lost somehow and come to register, present themselves, register in effect one person registering twice using different identity cards. Mm. So the commission was forced to, to move ahead of the registrar of persons to use biometrics because the elections were heated from the 2007 uh, events. So we had to find a better way of uh, uniquely identifying voters, even though the registrar was not ready with biometrics. So that's the only reason we keep biometrics. Uh, we would rather not, but uh, that is the situation. Okay, so perhaps I think you're in a transitionary period. Okay, hold on. I'm going to come back to you on some of the other, other practices that you're taking, but they're definitely very different than in South Africa. They represent different. Yes. So um, why don't we go to Guinea to understand where Guinea stands in, in, this, uh, in this regard. Um, I will interact with Madame Kamara in English. Madame Kamara will respond in French, and then our interpreter will interpret back to English. So Madame Kamara, um, how do you manage the identity uh, and you constitute the voter roles in Guinea? Uh, Madame 
Donc, Madame Camara, comment consultez-vous votre liste Good morning, everyone. Et je vous remercie euh, vraiment pour l'opportunité que vous me donnez ce matin. Thank you for, very much for the opportunity you were given me this morning. Les listes électorales en Guinée sont informatisées depuis 1992 sans biométrie. The electoral lists in Guinea are digitalized since 1992 in Guinea. But without biometrics. Donc, uh, without biometrics. Sans biométrie, oui. Sans biométrie, effectivement. So effective, yes, without biometrics. Et la Guinée a commencé à intégrer la biométrie en 2008 jusqu'en 2010, parce que le processus a pris plus de deux ans avec le décès de, de l'ancien président et l'arrivée de la junte au pouvoir. Um, so the biometrics started being inserted in 2008 and continued to 2010 and it uh, got delayed a little bit due to um, uh, the former president passing away and the transferring of power. Euh, donc nous avons aujourd'hui des listes électorales biométriques So today we have biometric les, la capture des 10 empreintes digitales. With capturing of 10 fingerprints. Avec les 10 empreintes digitales. With 10 fingerprints. Et nous avons pu quand même améliorer avec nos partenaires lors de la dernière élection. And with our partners during the former during the former elections we have been able to um, improve it with a new identification system pour détecter les mineurs dans la base de données, les gens qui n'ont pas 18 ans et qui ne sont pas autorisés à voter. To be able to detect the minors in the list, uh, people who aren't 18 and are not allowed to vote. Um, Il faut what... comprendre que tout est... Continue. Yes. Continue. Continue. Merci Continue, beaucoup. Madame. Donc, il faut comprendre que euh, pour être électeur en République de Guinée, il y a un certain nombre de documents qu'il faut avoir. So, to be able to be in the electoral list in Guinea, you need to provide a certain number of documents. Nous avons le passeport. Passport. La carte d'identité nationale. The national ID card. La carte d'identité scolaire. The student card or education card. Le livret militaire. The military registry. Le livret civil. The civil registry. Et une attestation euh, d'identification. And a certificate of identification. Euh, ces documents permettent à tous citoyens qui ont l'âge de voter de se faire inscrire sur les listes électorales. All these documents allow for a person to be able to be registered in the electoral lists. Just hold on a second. I can clarify something. Hold on, madame. So, so Guinea takes the approach that you want to allow as many people the right to vote. So you accept any document that you think is acceptable. You don't require a national ID. You don't require a national ID number. You can accept any other identifier, including attestation from community leaders in order to franchise, in order to allow people to vote. You, you take a, a broad approach to um, voter registration. Is that correct? Oui, nous avons une approche très large parce que nous n'avons pas d'état civil informatisé ni biométrique, donc nous n'avons pas un registre national informatisé d'état civil. Okay. Uh, yes, we do have to have a broad view because we don't have a digitalized civil registry of the population. Okay. Donc nous donnons la chance à ceux qui n'ont pas d'extrait de naissance, qui n'ont pas la possibilité d'avoir des cartes d'identité de s'inscrire et d'exercer leur droit de vote. Right. So we would like we want to allow people who don't have the birth certificate to still have the right to vote. Right. Okay. So in the approach to Guinea because you are open 
you're very open. Uh, you use technology um, and business processes to combat fraud. For example, you use biometrics to ensure one vote, uh, one voter per register. But you said something very intriguing. For the first time, you are using artificial intelligence or technology to detect minors through their face recognition. Uh, can you speak how well this feature works? Merci beaucoup. Uh, au fait, nous commençons, uh, nous avons deux niveaux de, 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 de biométrie que nous utilisons. Nous commençons par les empreintes digitales. Mm. So we have two levels of biometrics that we have been using, and first is the fingerprints. Et nous avons la comparaison faciale que nous utilisons également. And also the facial recognition. Donc ces deux jumelés permet au fait de détecter les doublons et de les radier de la liste. Okay. So those two technologies combined allow to eradicate uh, duplications and uh, take them off the list. Et ce qui causait un problème et qui faisait que l'acceptation de, des listes électorales était la présence des mineurs sur les listes électorales. And what was causing trouble was the presence of minors in the electoral lists. Et nous avons pu quand même, avec notre partenaire, mettre un système en place pour essayer d'identifier les personnes qui avaient moins de 18 ans. Le système permet quand même de détecter les plus jeunes jusqu'à 12, 13 ans. Il pouvait, c'est une probabilité, nous dire effectivement que cette personne n'a pas 18 ans. Il est dans une marge de 10 à 13 ans. Et le reste okay. se fait par l'arbitrage humain. So we have been able with our technical technological partners to establish a system of facial recognition that allows to detect if uh, people presenting themselves are children um, in the age range of 12 to 13 years old. So the system will raise a warning um, indicating the age of the person according to facial recognition from around 10 to 13 years old. Right. Okay. Madame Camaro. Hold on one second. Let, let, me, let me put in context. I think this is a major, major uh, development, in my opinion, because biometrics being used for deduplication and ensuring uniqueness um, has, been, has been available for the last 20 years. However, being able to use facial analysis in order to um, establish, establish what, a probability that somebody is underage and therefore give it to an investigator to investigate uh, is of utmost, utmost importance. And so I think all the African electoral commissions need to be uh, looking at this technology. I'm not yet convinced that we've got technologies out there that are 100% in the performance, but they still could contribute something. We'll talk to the technologists about this in a second. Um, unfortunately, we've been having problems getting Chidi in and out. Uh, Chidi, are we having a stable network? Madame Kamara, hang on there. I'm, I'm talk to Chidi to keep up with the, with the flow. Um, are you able to join us? Yeah, I am here now, and I pray that uh, the network that is bad will allow me to speak. Yeah. Okay, please, um, let's the benefit question from you the... asked. Yes, Chidi, can you, can you explain how do you yes. identify, identify your voters? Okay, first of all, um, we use the voter's card. So if we're going to use the voter's card and because we want to do authentication, we must capture biometrics. And so we started capturing biometrics at this time, the fingerprints alone, about 2000, and 10, 2011. And so when you finish capturing the fingerprint, we do not have any foundational strong system as at that time. So how do you now identify the staff, the voter who is coming to vote? So what we decided to do is to bring in an innovation that we normally call just a simple word, smart card reader, so that when you come as a person, it will check life, takes your fingerprint life and check it whether it is the same fingerprint that we've already put in the chip. So we now have that kind of card and everybody had what we call a permanent voter's card. 
So that was 20,000 in the 2011. We used it to do 2015 election, which was good for us. So we needed to improve. We tried to improve because there are some loopholes, because the idea is to make sure that whoever that is coming to vote is the person. If you don't do that, you find out that all your money is waste. So in 2019, we tried to, try to get into loopholes, but we have election in 2023, and that's what we are working now. So we, we are going to two-prong scenario. We have harmonization in the country because the NIMSI, which has to do with foundational ID card, is now growing. It's almost about 54, 55 million. But we know that before 2023, uh, most, of, most Nigerians may not have it. So we don't want to do the same franchise. So, but we have started working with NIMSI so that the data we're going to have will be harmonized with NIMSI, Nigerian Identity Management, uh, commission. So with that, we also now have included facial. So in the next registration, we want to launch next month. We will get your fingerprint if you are coming newly and we'll get your facial. If you have been there, that's what we call review. Review yourself. Whether the picture you have there is yours, if it's not yours, come and take a new picture. And again, if you have gone to do election, if you have gone to vote, and the system says this carry that this fingerprint is not yours, come back, we'll recapture you. Because our plan for next 2023 is that we're going to do biomodal authentication. What do I mean by biomodal authentication? We do this because we're in Africa. We have to check your fingerprint if it goes, you go and vote. If your fingerprint do not go, we use facial recognition to check you. So these are the innovations we are bringing. And then most importantly, uh, technology is improving. So we want you know, the middle class and the top elite, they're not like to go to their rural area to register. So we're bringing it online voter registration. You can update online, you can do transfer online. And then if you do new registration online, you go back to the registration of any state, any state you are in the local government or the state headquarters, we capture your fingerprint and facial so that we have what we call a very balanced uh, voter registration system. To so give us one, because after the voter registration, the next thing is to authenticate. After the authentication, which is the key, key accreditation, then you can do election. So I want to hold it there until if there are any other questions that I could explain. Yeah, Thank okay. You, that's great. So, so let's just let's just see. So far, we've heard uh, from the four uh, commission. They basically are saying that you're using biometrics first and foremost to deduplicate, either through uh, a pre-process in the foundational system, or you're doing the deduplication at the time um, when you are enrolling in the electoral commission's database. Um, you're using. Um, the idea to go multi-biometric is an important idea because in fact, it allows you um, two capabilities that we did not have before. First one is what Madame Kamara has indicated, which was the idea that if you use face, you're able to get um, an age estimation. And then what Chidi has said, if you use face in addition, it can give you a backup in case the fingerprint fails for some reason, so multi multimodal, uh, uh, multiple biometrics can help you um, uh, deal with that. So, so it seems like we are converging towards the idea that multiple biometrics could help. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about um, about how sustainable and how costly that is. I mean, in uh, Sai, the, the South African Commission decided to let all the identity management be done by the Home Affairs because it's leveraged across multiple applications. Um, but how do you verify? Because Chidi explained to us, you can verify the day of the vote. In South Africa, since you're not accessing the biometric from the Home Affairs, um, how do you verify people when they arrive that they are, they are who they claim to be? And how do you make sure they don't end up voting multiple times? Yes, thanks. Um, on, on voting day, uh, you need your national identity document. And there are two or, or three that are competent. Firstly, it's your green barcode ID book. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And then we've introduced a, a smart card ID and disclosed at the moment approximately um, between 10 and 15 million of them in, uh, in circulation. And these are intended to replace the, the green barcode ID. And then thirdly, it's the temporary identification certificate. Let's say on the eve of an election, you lose your, your ID, you lose your smart card, or you lose your green barcode. Right. You can go to Home Affairs to go get an emergency identification, which is called a temporary identification certificate. All these have your photo on them. So the when you get to a voting station, you, you, there will be a voter's roll, and your name will only appear at the voting station where you applied and nowhere else. Hmm. We will, the voter, the voting official will compare uh, your names as per the voter's role against your names on, um, on, the, on the identity document. So that's the first control that we have. We are also introducing a new voter management device, which will confirm if you've, pre you've presented elsewhere. In other words, if you have presented at any other station before the one to which uh, you have come. Our framework, therefore, is based on dealing with disputes about identification and eligibility ahead on election day. So on election day, um, it is not an opportunity to be raising objections, really. You, there's a, a specific provision made in the election timetable for people to raise objections around whether a person is eligible, whether a person is not of a uh, right age, whether the person has impersonated, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. All those matters are dealt with during uh, the inspection process. And on election day, really, it's um, a, a, to ensure that the person who presents is the person who's on the voters' roll. Who's on the voter list. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Sai. Michael, how does Kenya verify? We know that you deduplicate using biometrics, using temperance, but how do you verify the identity of the voter on the day of the vote? Thank you. Thank you for the question. On the day of the vote, we have a different device called a voter verification device where we mm -hmm. store the biometrics uh, which are is localized to the polling station uh, to which the voter is registered. So the voter mm -hmm. presents their fingerprints and uh, the thumb or the index finger and it, uh, it, it identifies and uh, brings to the screen the records from the local database on the tablet. This is extracted from the biometric register in a central location. Uh, it is after that that the voter is allowed to vote. Yeah. So it's not going live. Somebody's asking a question. Uh, this is Niranjan Gosavi is asking the question, is Kenya using online verification of biometrics? Um, you're not using online verification, right? No, it, it's not online. That would be not present online. a lot of challenges because of network, no, the network. mobile network availability. It's not everywhere. Okay. And somebody's saying, Christopher Anthony is asking you, did I hear correctly that Kenya would rather not use biometric but have no choice? Uh, please elaborate. Um, no, no I, I said the Electoral Commission would rather not store biometrics if these biometrics were already collected by the already civil collected. registration. So then our situation was, at the time we needed biometrics, the civil registration was not already biometric. Right. Even now it's not 100% biometric, but if they get to that, then it would be better to query that central database. That way it's easier to manage the underage dead voters and that kind of thing. So right now, the way it is, we have to keep asking through very manual methods 
querying them to know voters who have passed on so that uh, they can be deleted from the register. Right. Okay, great. So, uh, Chidi, let's, let's, go, let's go to 2023. By then, uh, NIMSI would have enrolled a lot more people. I mean, at least 100 million adults uh, should have been already in the database. How will this change? Will the 2023 elections require you to collect biometric data of the new um, voters, or will you rely exclusively on NIMSI? W- what is your vision in that transition? 2022? Uh, sorry, I'm talking to, to, um, to okay. Nigeria. No, sorry. Right. It's me. Okay, for us, as we are doing registration now, any new registrant is expected to give us his name. If he doesn't have name, we will still register him. It's not mandatory. You still register. So those that have registered with us with that name, yes, we will register because we eventually take that data to NIMSI to harmonize so that we can verify those information. But you still uh, capture their biometric for them. You will still so, capture the biometric, right? Well, we, 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 we will capture at this stage now. Every capturing is important. We we'll harmonize right. at the back, so we will capture the biometrics, capture the facial, capture all fields that NIMSI required. And we'll ask him, "Do you have a name?" If he has a name, we put it. If he doesn't have a name, we we'll leave it. When okay. we finish, we will now harmonize with the NIMSI. However, during election, we are putting our system in such a simple way that by 2023, once you have a voter's card, we don't really need so much chips. We just get either your barcode or other VIN number or even NIN number We prop you up because the data that will be in our system in every voting station, we have the biometrics, including the facial and the fingerprint, and we check you instantly mm-hmm. there. And if you're okay, you can vote. If not, no vote. That's so so, so you, you will continue to actually manage your own database, but you will harmonize it to, in order to improve the trust in it with the NIN. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. We Great. are Michael, hoping that after twenty twenty three, subsequently, we'll get there. Subsequently, it might be derived just like South Africa. Okay. So, Michael, um, going back to you, you have a closer election in twenty twenty two, and the Huduma number is not likely to be ready. Where Where do you think your voter registration is gonna is gonna be like? What is it gonna be like? myself. Currently, we are at uh, 19.6 million voters. Uh, the plan is to build on that because there's no time to, to do a new voter registration. So we'll build on the database we already have and the Uduma number is not yet ready for prime use in elections. Uh, many voters would be disenfranchised because not everybody has it. So the plan is to use the database as it is now with the new voters who will be coming on board, having attained the new age and such cases. Okay, so you're basically gonna continue uh, what you're doing. You're not waiting for the Duma number to come in order to allow the elections to take place. No, yes. we, con- we continue with what we have. You, you're continuing exactly what you're doing. Okay, yes. so that's great. Right. Um, uh, Sai, what, what do you, th- and Sai and Madame uh, Kamara, what do you think is the percentage coverage of your uh, voter register relative to the population of eligible voters? Do you think you've reached your ideal goal of franchising everybody? Uh, at this point in time, there's no more to be done, just people are resistant or... Where are you in, in the franchising people? If I go first, uh, Dr. Tick, um, yes, we are, yes, as I said, 20, uh, 25.7, 7, 25. million uh, voters on the roll against uh, an estimated uh, voting age population of 30, 30, 35 million. So uh, we are also scheduled for a, a census um, in 2022, which will give us a more accurate um, estimation of voting age population. Are we satisfied? Certainly not. Um, we are ahead of an election 
we opened 23,000 uh, voting stations and we support that with an extensive uh, communication campaign. So this year we are having for local government elections in October and on the 17th and 18th of uh, July, we're going to be opening no less than 23,000 voting stations, which are voting stations in communities where people live and they remain open between eight and five on both days uh, for people to register. But we are also introducing additional modalities. For the first time, we will be launching an electronic registration um, um, uh, opportunity. Online, where online. if you have a, yeah, online, if you have a mobile device, um, you'll be able to go to a voucher portal um, type in your name, uh, scan in your, um, your ID, and then there are certain verifications that we do. Um, uh, and then you are, you are registered and placed on the correct segment of the, of the voters roll. All these are geared um, to facilitate access to the electoral process. Okay, so we're seeing we're seeing South Africa doing doing online vote uh, online registration. We're seeing Nigeria doing online registration. We're seeing Guinea um, adopting <coughs> new new technologies for as, uh, establishing uh, age and minor detection, etc. All have mechanisms to eliminate du du duplications. I think, I mean, we'll talk to the experts uh, in a second. But it seems to me that you've been adopting measures to combat all of the weaknesses that have, have existed because the identity management practices in the continent uh, suffered from the lack of civil registration at birth and documentation at birth, et cetera. So you, you have a workaround which seems to be, be working very well. Um, franchising is going to be always an objective. And so making it as easy as possible um, to, to do that. So basically, um, let us bring in a couple of people um, on the panel. Madame Kamara, while, while bringing two people on the, on the panel um, from the community, can you explain what is your um, coverage uh, of eligible voters, especially I'm worried about women. Um, how do you feel um, that, they, that they are well represented? Merci beaucoup. Euh, la population guinéenne est estimée aujourd'hui, selon les statistiques de l'Institut national, à 14 millions environ. Et là, nous sommes à, à peu près à entre 40 et 48% des citoyens enrôlés. Donc, nous sommes à 5 millions et quelques électeurs qui sont enregistrés sur les listes électorales. Donc, nous avons pratiquement atteint les objectifs fixés. So, um, the, we are a population of 14 million of uh, uh, people who could be registered as a voter. And uh, we enrolled more or less 40 to 48 percent, which is around 5 million um, citizens that are enrolled. Donc l'objectif est, est atteint à plus de 80%, nous pouvons le noter ainsi. So we consider that uh, we have fulfilled our objectives of about 80%. Okay. Uh, what about women? How do you see the women participation? Il faut, il faut vraiment dire que de, beaucoup d'efforts ont été fournis pour l'enrôlement des femmes sur les listes électorales en Guinée. Les femmes sont à 52% euh, présentes sur les listes électorales en Guinée. Okay. Women, are pres uh, women are present on the list uh, by 52%. So there are 52% of women registered on the electoral lists in Guinée. There has been a specific training for enrolling women. Okay, so, so you, you are paying attention that franchising needs to focus on the minorities, needs to focus on disadvantage, such as women in, in your campaigns. Okay, we, 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 um, we, we had somebody on the community voice that wanted to say something about the experience of the DRC Congo, but somehow he, uh, he uh, disappeared. 
Um, anyway, we're going to continue moving. Um, let's give our um, uh, illustrious panelists a pause. I'm going to continue this discussion with a with a technologist perspective. So, and I'll come back to this to this panel, but I'll give you a pause. So, um, operator, could you please uh, bring in um, Vincent and Lyle um, and put on pause this current panel? Okay, so Vincent and Lyle, both of you come from uh, long uh, experience, uh, almost 20 years in the domain of using technology and biometrics in the, in the service of the electoral process and building trust in that. Um, Africa adopted the, the biometrics for electoral management very early. Uh, in a way, uh, this came with a learning curve. There were some bumps along the way, and we've come a long way. Uh, some of these bumps are still what the critics are using to say, well, the technology is a failure and it doesn't do this. So I want to start by talking to Vincent from a technology and algorithm point of view. Um, over the last 20 years, how much progress has the technology made in terms of accuracy and failures that we used to see in the old days? And what is what, they, what is there remaining to do? So let's talk a little bit about the accuracy and robustness. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Adik, for having us uh, today. <clears throat> so regarding accuracy, I think uh, the, main, the, the two main modalities that are being used uh, in elections uh, on the African continent are fingerprint and face. Um, uh, it began with fingerprint, which has much more maturity from the technology perspective than face has currently. Um, and we've been able for the last 20 years to deploy uh, with some success, of course, there's been a learning curve, uh, the, uh, the, the fingerprint modality and later on complete it uh, with the multi-biometric systems involving, involving face. Uh, with, with, with fingerprints, I think in terms of accuracy, as soon as you enroll a significant number of fingers, let's say, you know, six to 10, the accuracy seems to be uh, very good to begin with. What we've been working on uh, uh, for the last years is making the technology more inclusive, making sure that regardless of um, potentially how damaged the fingerprints are, uh, potentially uh, missing fingers uh, for people who have had accidents with the hands, for, for, for instance, all those people will not be disenfranchised and will be able to use the system the same way the others do. So more inclusiveness also, requiring less resources to do the same uh, deduplication, uh, uh, acquisition and coding of, of, of images is something important, which led us to be able to deploy this technology in a mobile environment. For example, being able to not only do one-to-one -one when you go into a, a polling station and you want to verify identity, but also potentially do a one-to-many on a, on a smaller database to check whether that person who is not supposed to be in that police station is actually supposed to be in the police station right next to it and being able to direct that person to the right polling station, for example. So being able to write one to many identification in a mobility context right in the polling station was, was also quite an achievement. Um, we also uh, worked a lot on the robustness of the equipment to the environment, typically being able to, in a mobile environment, potentially without a power source, having equipment which is able to sustain the full operation uh, of election day um, and make it globally more adaptable to the environment. One example that we have is uh, typically we would, we would propose tablets, we would be loaded with the electoral roll for the designated police station. But if for some reason, one of those tablets malfunctions, then you have to be able to switch one equipment from one police station to another and may, and may be able to reconfigure it very quickly so that it can be used in a, in a, in a bit of a different context. So something that we've been uh, 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 working on. So for the fingerprint, it's mostly about inclusion. Now face recognition technology uh, has seen the most impressive progress over the last years, right? Uh, I, I used to say that we are dividing error rates by two every six months. And I think we have accelerated uh, that now, and, and we're happy. We're very happy with the result that we see at the NIST evaluation that happened uh, very frequently. And one can see that over a multi-million database, now the error rates of face recognition are very low. Now that being said, 
uh, face is still not as robust to the environment as fingerprinters. Um, you still have illumination issues. You still have other type of usability issues that, that make it not suitable, I think, for the entire operation on its own. But combined with fingerprints, we have a very, very strong uh, technology. And I'm, I'm going to stop there just to, to leave. Um, yeah. what, what do you think the use of face for, for minor detection, for underage detection? Do you think this is real? This can, can really yield results? I think it'd be, it can be useful, definitely. Uh, uh, now, the, I guess the law puts a very definite threshold on how old you need to be to be able to vote, right? And I don't think that right. any algorithm at the moment is able to pinpoint your date of birth to the day, right? right. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it can definitely help. I think weeding out maybe the most extreme cases and then reverting back to a, a, a human operator for verification and validation of what the algorithm thinks. I think there's a pretty pretty smart way to approach this, yes. Okay, hold on for, for a second. I wanna to talk to Lyle a little bit, I'll come back to you. Um, Lyle, we've seen um, the, the evolution of the solutions, not just the technology, technology has improved quite a bit, but we've seen also, we went from desktops to hybrids to um, basically equipment that are, that are uh, tablets and then mobile, etc. Now, all of this equipment um, basically, the critics have said costs a lot of money, and it's all one-time use, and therefore, um, uh, in the affordability of the elections, uh, people have estimated that enrolling a vote could be between three to five dollars per voter. So, how does the sustainability of these systems um, work out, and how do you lower the cost of that investment so that? elections don't continue to cost a lot of money. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Etik, and uh, hi to everybody on, on the panel. So I think, I think firstly, from, from a cost point of view, there's, there's a, a lot more optionality today than, than what we had a, a decade ago. So, you know, previously, you know, there was a, a focus on using uh, registration kits for the registration. Where, where now there are you know, various options from, from kits to fantastic uh, mobile tablets that can do temp temperance captures in, in more remote areas, um, as well as good alternatives on, on integrated desktops. And costs have certainly um, decreased uh, tr tremendously. I think in terms of where the business model has to move towards an election space, I think the community we have to strive to, to push the model into an elections as a service model. Um, election so as a elections as a service model. Um, you know, virtually every tender that, you know, we see come out, um, you know, the specifications are, are completely, completely different. And, you know, it's, as, a, as a supplier, it becomes quite a challenge to actually standardize equipment that can then be rotated. Uh, across various countries and, and, and offer elections as a service. So I think what, what the focus should be on is actually defining some key standards. Um, you know, in terms of what's required uh, from a registration, as an example, I mean, the key, the key requirement is to have a, a high quality record, uh, both on the fields captured, as well as uh, the quality of the images, if you're using facial and the quality of the the, the, the fingerprints uh, for, for fingerprints and, and iris as well. So if that standard is uh, well, well defined and uh, in order to do a voter registration across a number of countries, if various countries adopt that standard, it becomes a lot easier for suppliers to actually productize against a standard rather than trying to meet RAM and ROM and battery um, requirements on, on each tender as, as an example. So I think that standardization will allow us as suppliers, for example, to hold five or 10,000 registration devices uh, in stock, uh, offer in 2021 for the countries that have elections, offer that equipment as a service, you know, move, move on to 2022 and, and 2023 onwards. So I think, I think that's a, a critical uh, step and, and where I think we should be going with, I think the key takeaway uh, being elections as a service and, and certifications. I think another, another, another point I'd also like to touch on in terms of the evolution of technology. I think biometrics has been a critical, a critical brick that's been put in place, actually, I think, in Africa better than anywhere in the world. And yeah, that's um, correct. 
and and I've obviously got visibility across you know various continents in terms of their approach. So I think I think another critical brick um, that's highly required, and which I think addresses your second key topic of trust and transparency in the in the system. And I think it's it's an under uh, underrated brick is actually the implementation of IoT methodologies uh, into election equipment. Um, and the reason for that is you know what that's going to allow is uh, you know, live central uh, central data analytics, uh, live red flagging, so that you know problems out in the field can actually be detected proactively rather than uh, reactively. And I think what it also allows is it allows the community of stakeholders, whether it's voters, candidates, parties, uh, election observers, to actually you know through various portals that allow them to see you know, what their requirements are from, from the data um, to actually be part of, part of the machine uh, and have visibility in terms of the active running of the machine rather than just, you know, um, waiting for reports and being outside of the process. So I think another, in terms of reliability, is bringing, bringing the, the stakeholders into, into the, a, a, a proactive observation viewpoint. And that, that in my opinion, is going to is going to take the application of IoT methodologies into how registration equipment and verification um, equipment is utilized. So, so are you saying that that there will be a dashboard that's accessible to all the stakeholders? That will be a real time dashboard where, where things are happening. Exactly, and I think what's also important to note is, you know, obviously as a company, we we've got a very strong understanding of the infrastructure constraints. Uh, within Africa, having done a number of elections in Africa, and as of as of now, I mean, we're piloting the technology uh, very successfully. And you know, in terms of uh, uh, communication coverage, you know, even if you're sitting with ninety or ninety-five, in, and most countries in Africa are, are, are way over the ninety-five mark, um, mm-hmm. you know, the the ability to be able to track that data live on a dashboard. I mean, you know, just to give a visual sort of uh, uh, illustration. You know, an election commission could sit in front of a dashboard of a map and see which machines are active and actively registering uh, voters or verifying voters. You know, if a machine becomes inactive from a maintenance point of view, there's obviously a, a nice um, advantage because you can react quite quickly. But I think from a transparency point of view, imagine giving that dashboard to, you know, parties that can actually watch how, how the system's working uh, you know, live in front of them, you know, through registration mm-hmm. or verification um, and actually get comfort that the machine is working, the election machine is working and that the, the process is, is fair. So, you know, if one polling station goes down because of a power surge or, you know, technical malfunction, because that's all that's reported in the media and exacerbated right. by social media, there's clear visibility that, you know, the other 99.99% of the system is, is functioning well as intended. And you know, with that one one station going down, you can very very quickly react and, and get it back up. Okay, so I, I mean that, that's a fair point. I think uh, we need we need to keep in mind that even this dashboard concept was criticized in recent elections because people said that it gave during the day it gave the opposing parties a sense of where the problem and how to prepare the attack. On, on the results, and especially in the United States, basically when when the when the results were being tallied from the online uh, or from the physical polling versus the by mail, um, this was used to say, well, they knew how many votes they needed, and so they ended up in fabricated fabricating it. So yes, I think we need transparency, but also we need to make sure that that information. Um, there is a sense of what that information is, who has access to it, and and at what point does that information become public? But it's a fair point um, because we need we need to understand how um, how do we give everybody who's a stakeholder a sense of that there's no black box mystery, there's no magic, things are working votes are being tallied, etc. We'll come back to that with Vincent. He's got some ideas on accountability uh, and, and, um, and, and verifiability. I'll do it at the end. But I want to have the operator run a poll because I think people are wondering, I want to see if people agree if biometrics have, have given um, 
uh, improve the integrity of electoral elections in Africa or not. And um, Vincent, in the meantime, I want to talk to you about um, the role of the selfie, because we seem to be in the selfie revolution. Um, okay, so operator, um, let's get the poll going. Uh, okay, so the question again, do you think biometrics have helped improve the integrity of the electoral processes in Africa? And yes, no, and maybe. Okay, so okay, I think we can see a definite pattern here. Uh, operator, um, a fair warning: three, two, one, and the poll, please, and put put the results for the YouTube uh, viewers online, please. So, just put a slide, please. Um, we can see, basically, there are still people who are skeptical. Uh, we've got 20% who say maybe. We've got 13% who say no. And of course, 67% who say yes. Um, biometrics have helped improve the integrity of the electoral process in Africa. Okay. Um, so, Vincent, I want to come back to you. Are we living in the selfie revolution? We're seeing a lot of selfies that are making business processes change. Can we use the selfies for... Uh, voter uh, verification. I mean, if this is as simple as that, letting people vote from their mobile device and do a selfie verification or have a selfie uh, at the place of the uh, electoral poll. So uh, <clears throat> I think definitely facial recognition has made, has made tremendous strides in terms, in terms of accuracy, in terms of usability. Uh, over the last years, that 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 that's a very very clear uh, phenomenon, and we we obviously I didn't yet participate in that. Uh, now, I I would make a difference between uh, um, everything that happens online and everything that would happen in the voting station. Um, I think for one to one verification, mm -hmm. I, I I really don't see why uh, we shouldn't we we couldn't use uh, at least as an alternate. Uh, facial recognition to to do voter um, uh, identity confirmation in terms of raw technology capability, really. Uh, when it comes to online voting, I think there's a, a full host of other issues that pops up when you when you begin to start thinking about I'm going to be um, uh, uh, voting with my phone with my personal phone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's an unregistered and unmanaged device uh, which could be compromised in any number of ways. Um, and even, even if the biometric verification happens exactly the way it should, and there are certainly ways to make that happen, uh, there are a, a full other uh, category of, of threats and issues that might come up in how I express my vote, how my vote is being recorded, uh, how it is transmitted to uh, uh, the back end for, for tallying, uh, for example. So, even if, and maybe that's something that we touch on a bit more at the end of the, uh, uh, of the session, uh, even if facial recognition in and of itself has made probably enough uh, progress for it to be usable um, in the same fashion that fingerprint technology has, think of it, 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 it does have a lot of merits in the sense that typically, even if we call about bespoke devices, um, um, acquisition devices are very cheap with facial recognition because almost any camera on the market is able to do a decent uh, facial image, right? There are still illumination issues, obviously, but especially in a polling station where you don't have to worry too much about presentation attack detection or so-called spoofing attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then I think from the acquisition side, uh, uh, this could be uh, something that could drive the cost down. Uh, it has very low failure to acquire rate in the sense that uh, uh, it, it's very difficult to make a bad image uh, of a face image bad enough for it, for the algorithm not to be able to process it. And it's manually verifiable on the spot, right? Yeah. Which is not the case for fingerprints and even more complicated for iris. I mean, I've spent hours looking at images of irises and I don't think I can make the verification myself. Um, so, uh, well, I can for fingerprints. So it, it does come with benefit. Uh, now, uh, projecting that capability online is an entire different story, which I don't think the biometric modality of verification will be the main one. Mm. So you're, you're basically for the use of selfie for verification in a physical context, but you're not for online 
uh, voting yet because you feel the cybersecurity aspects are still not resolved. The trust aspects is even worse in that context. Yeah, and unrelating to, to the biometric verification, really. It, 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 whatever exactly. comes after biometric verification, that, that raises issue, in my, in my opinion. Yes. Right, exactly. Okay, uh, today it seems that we've been having problems with the network. A lot of our community voice people keep coming in and out. Uh, their networks keep disconnecting. Uh, we've had somebody who wanted to share something from the experience in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, actually, or, or the DRC. Uh, Michelle, could you present yourself and, and say who you are and state your purpose? Yes, I'm Michel Chavez. I'm biometrics uh, citizen research expert. So uh, from now I'm in the Ivory Coast for some legs, but uh, I've uh, heard of experience in uh, DRC for uh, the duplication of uh, voters. So uh, biometric voter registration was done by uh, one firm, which was uh, Gemalto. But for the duplication was done by no technology based on fingerprints and on face. And uh, it was the first time that uh, an algorithm to detect uh, under 18 uh, of age people was used. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, has, it has given uh, so so results because he, he, it has, uh, the algorithm has uh, detected uh, where uh, people uh, which were, uh, were, were uh, about 16, but uh, it was more difficult on the gray zone between, uh, between 17 and, and 20. It's much more difficult. So I've talked uh, with no technology expert which were on the, on the field in DSC in 2018. In, uh, at IDF for, for Africa in, in South Africa. And they told me it was difficult, but they have improved their, their, their algorithm. So, okay. but to, to answer to, me, to Mr. Boatou, uh, to use face uh, deduplication, it, it means that you, are, you must have strict training of uh, operator who take the photo on the field because, okay, everybody can take a, a, a nice photo of someone, but the photo must respect the ICAO rules. So it means mouth shut, eyes, eyes wide open, uh, and some equilibrium between the shades and light on the face. So it's not so easy. It needs a very strict uh, training of uh, face photo uh, operators which, which take uh, the okay. photo. So, so Michelle, uh, this is a useful experience to know. I mean, we've got DRC, we've got Guinea. I think other countries in Africa will be experimenting with this. It'll be good to keep us posted in terms of the improvements in the algorithms and how they they will um, impact um, an, an, an area which is very important, preventing underage voters from joining the electoral rolls. Um, Michelle, thank you. Um, Lai, do you want to close that element? Yeah, so I think uh, actually uh, Michelle raises a great point in terms of, you know, you can have the, the most sophisticated camera and algorithms for facial capture, but if your environment that you take the photo in doesn't allow the correct lighting, you get a poor image. Um, right. I mean, we, in the field, uh, the way we've gotten around that is using like booths uh, around the person, foldable booths. Um, but I think the key point that I want to make is the, the, the reality, I think, especially for deduplication, um, I think the, the, the fingerprint still has to hold uh, primacy uh, in, that, in that algorithm. But I think it's very advantageous to have a second layer uh, being, mm -hmm. being the facial capture to then improve you know, as a second thread of uh, deduplication. So I think, I think it's the facial image will never hold primacy, especially where you're registering people out in remote areas of the field. But I think despite that, it holds a lot of value, um, uh, you know, for yeah. a second layer of deduplication as well as authentication at a later stage uh, in, okay. in a offline manner. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, um, for joining us. Vincent, I'll come back to you after, after the sec second session. Um, operator, I'd like to continue this discussion by getting a perspective on the same topic still from the electoral observer, from the Carter, 
um, and we'll also take some community voices at the same time. Uh, so uh, prepare yourself if you've raised your hand, you want to come on the board, on the on the panel, um, get on and and uh, let's let's have the conversation. Um, Tauna, thank you for joining us. Um, we've got to get your perspective. We've heard from the various countries, we've heard from the technologists. We want to get an independent view. Do you really think that biometrics have helped improve the integrity in elections in Africa? And what do you think the trend is going to lead us to? Thank you so much, uh, Doc, for having me on this platform. Uh, we must say that we are excited as an organization to uh, participate on one of the premier uh, discussion uh, forums uh, of this nation. Um, I come in with the uh, enviable position that I'm coming in right after a number of experts have actually spoken and uh, have um, provided quite a lot of irrefutable evidence uh, that can be used for purposes of uh, justifying the use of biometrics in elections. Um, I think speaking from um, an observer point of view, um, one has to realize, and I think it's a discussion that we've been having in our circles for over years, is pretty much around standard, around the motivation of introducing biometrics in elections. And uh, once we unpack and understand the motivation of introducing biometric in elections, we then can then be able to evaluate whether we have succeeded or not in terms of dealing with the issues that we wanted to deal with in the first instance. So one thing that we have actually observed is that the motivation in most cases is maybe borders around peer pressure of countries are also introducing biometric voter registration and as such we should be able to do so. Uh, because it seems fashionable, but I think it has to go into really uh, the key issues that that would have to be addressed by uh, the introduction of biometric voter registration in most cases. So I'll give an example. I have been discussing with a couple of colleagues in a number of countries, and the country wants to introduce biometric voter registration, and I would ask, um, what is your motivation? Why would you want to introduce biometric voter registration? Ah, oh, well, because um, countries in the region are also introducing biometric voter but I think for us to be able to have a clear evaluation of whether we are succeeding or not, the starting point is to unpack what motivates us to go into biometric voter registration. Are we addressing the issues that we intended to address in the first instance? And to that extent, is the mode uh, or the um, technology that we are introducing addressing those issues. So I had, for instance, had to go back in discussions where you have to say, okay, fine, let's go back to your original um, uh, voter register. What were the issues? Well, I think maybe duplications, yes, then I think maybe you can then be able to address them by introducing uh, biometric voter registration insofar as if they be able to deduplicate your register. But then you also get the confusion around identification and polling stations where you get, um, uh, 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 advocates for introduction of um, uh, biometrics saying, okay, but we want to avoid um, uh, uh, fraudulent voting, but they do not necessarily understand what mode of biometrics they're introducing for purposes of either deduplicating the register or for purposes of um, 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 identification of polling station. I could say to a large extent, uh, Biometric voter registration has managed to deal with some of the critical issues that we identified in past elections in the past world, particularly when it comes to deduplication of register to that extent. But it cannot, you know, in its own, I think um, it's not a panacea to the challenges uh, that are faced normally uh, in elections in Africa. There are quite a number of interrelated issues that have to come into play and have to be addressed in the first instance. Uh, in order for biometric voter registration to work. And for instance, like you indicated in your initial discussion, the base data that you're going to be using for purposes of identifying people that are going to be registered, the rest with the civil registry. So is your civil registry strong enough to the extent to which it can be able to support uh, uh, voter registration uh, uh, in terms of identifying those that are required or those are uh, legally uh, allowed to register in a specific country. So I think going back in processes and also looking at processes that feed into the voter registration to a large extent will be able to um, uh, give us an indication as to whether biometric registration in voter registration is succeeding or not. I'll, I'll rest on that.
so basically, if we have a very strong civil register, then, then clearly we don't really need biometrics. Uh, maybe biometric will add cost and will add um, uh, potential um, complexity. Um, but in Africa, we still have a challenge that many of the civil registers are not in a position to provide us with the ground truth. Um, to do that. Hold on to this to this thought for a second. I want to ask you a different question, Donna. You know, in, in, the, in the world of finance and public companies, uh, there is a role called auditors. So we get the financial results, uh, people audit, there's an independent body, it audits and issues a statement, and then the shareholders and investors believe in the auditing company's credibility. Why don't we have an analog of this? Uh, basically, organizations that have their job is to audit the voter rolls or to audit the, the results of the vote. Um, or, or this is happening, but it's not on a scale at the Pan-African scale. What do you think of the role of civil society as an auditor of elections? Well, I mean, coming to uh, voter registers, I think we have actually seen uh, a, a big movement, particularly within civil society, advocating uh, for all this of voters, uh, voters' role. And uh, we've actually seen a development of different methodologies that are coming into play uh, in terms of uh, uh, auditing of uh, a voters' role. But what we have not necessarily discovered, and one of the biggest challenges is the enabling uh, legal framework that allows for uh, the audit of uh, voter registers. And in most cases, I think when we are advocating for electoral reform, it's one area that we normally miss out on. And when it comes to issues of transparency, the transparency uh, in uh, registration processes, we then come into a counter strike where we are calling for the commissions in most cases to provide either the voters register in an auditable format, in a format that can be analyzed. Uh, to the extent to which you can then be able to use it for purposes of audit. So I've actually seen in a number of countries that we have observed elections, there's a slightly um, uh, pushback when it comes to commissions providing um, um, uh, voter registers that can be audited, uh, voter mm -hmm. registers that can be used for purposes of audit. And they cite quite a number of issues, particularly issues around uh, the confidentiality of data, uh, safeguarding data of those people that are registered in the world. Because even some of the methodologies that are uh, proposed, for, for instance, uh, people to list the list of people, would require that you have identities of people, you'd require that you have the addresses of the people so that you can do a, an audit of it. But what we've also seen, I mean, organizations like NDI uh, actually developed uh, extensive and interesting tools for computer audits where uh, voter registers are provided. But I think the fundamental issue that we need to be addressed is the legal framework that then allows for those audits to be carried out. And I think yeah. we are seeing a greater movement towards um, a framework uh, for audits of um, uh, voter registers uh, currently. Okay, so great. So we do need legal frameworks to enable auditing and perhaps uh, some sort of accreditation of who can be an auditor um, that can perform that task. Uh, we know that there are electoral observers. Now we need electoral auditors in order to, um, to ensure that the public does believe in the results. Okay, um, hold on to that thought. Dana, I want to take on some, some community voices. Um, Mugesha, um, could you please state who you are, where you come from, and state your purpose? Thank you so much. Could you come closer to the microphone, please? Could you come closer to the microphone, please? We, we, it keeps breaking. We cannot hear you. Uh, Mogisha? Mogisha? Yes, I was Mugesha, we, we cannot hear you. We, we cannot hear you. Um, operator, could you please work with Mugesha? Uh, no, we cannot hear you. Operator, could you please work with Mugesha on this problem? I will take Adum Hagar Abakar, please. Um, are, you, are you on or have we lost you? Can you hear me now? No, unfortunately, uh, something. 
Mr. Abakar, are you able to step in? Uh, oui, vous m'entendez? Oui, oui, oui. oui. Uh, vous voulez yeah. parler en français? Yeah, merci. Ok, uh, on a D'abord, je voudrais, uh, moi, c'est Monsieur Abakar Adumagar, hein, donc uh, un ancien membre de la, de la, de la CNI. I am Et, a former uh, member uh, of the CNI. Commission Electoral National Independent. Oui, Commission Electoral National Independent du Tchad. The National Commission. Uh, uh, donc, uh, j'interviens un peu. Bon, d'abord, avant d'intervenir, je voudrais d'abord vous féliciter et remercier pour cette uh, initiative. So, uh, before uh, uh, speaking, I would like to thank you for this initiative and congratulate you. Bien, au Tchad, moi, j'ai été uh, dans plusieurs uh, CNI. Euh, dans lequel nous avons commencé par un fichier euh, informatique numérique. So, yeah. at the Chad, I was part of several national electoral commissions where I was in charge of the uh, digital... Uh, Ensuite, uh, nous sommes passés uh, à un fichier électoral uh, biométrique. And then avec, we uh, moved to a biometric um, list. J'ai suivi très attentivement les différentes interventions euh, avec leur euh, expérience, différentes expériences dans plusieurs pays d'ailleurs. I followed euh, very attentively the different experiences from different countries. Mais moi j'arrive, euh, disons, après ma petite expérience, à une conclusion. C'est-à-dire que euh, la réalisation des fichiers électoraux biométriques d'un pays à un autre, euh, moi je note que c'est, c'est vraiment euh, un éternel recommencement. C'est-à-dire que um, uh, I am observing with my experience that from one country to another, every new case is a new beginning. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? En général, euh, au, au fil de l'évolution, hein, mon expérience date pratiquement de 20 ans. Au fil de l'évolution, euh, j'essaie de suivre ce qui se passe. Euh, les fichiers électoraux, je crois que le mien élaboré. Euh, je viens également d'écouter le représentant de Aidemia. Euh, le plus élaboré avec un mécanisme de, de vote avec kit d'identification s'est passé, je crois, euh, à la dernière élection du Kenya, avec les contestations dont on en connaît. So, um, I have uh, 20 years experience and I have been observing the evolution um, of these technologies and I have been listening to the IDEMIA and the cases in Kenya and all the uh, criticize, uh, critics that it has received. Je pense que le, le, le représentant du Kenya a intervenu. Peut-être qu'il pourra nous donner quelques détails dessus. Euh, le, 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 les, les élections euh, en Afrique avec les fichiers électoraux biométriques coûtent excessivement cher au regard de nos revenus. Et souvent, euh, dans la plupart des cas, euh, les élections finissent par des contestations, quels que soient euh, les exemples des fichiers le mieux élaborés de façon biométrique. Yeah. I think the representative from Kenya can speak later, maybe, but uh, in matters of biometrics, it, it is expensive for African countries. And we have been uh, observing that even with biometrics, the elections are uh, regularly criticized uh, anyway. Peut-être que j'anticipe, peut-être que je ne suis pas tout à fait dans le sujet, mais moi, je suis tenté de par ma petite expérience de dire Euh, est-ce qu'il ne vraiment faudrait pas plutôt se concentrer euh, sur le registre national de population biométrique mmh. avec civil. pour chaque état civil Merci, merci du terme. L'état civil. So I am maybe a little bit anticipating and off topic, but I'm wondering if we shouldn't focus on the biometric national civil registry. Okay. En ce moment, oui. Oui. Let, let me let me summarize. Um, basically, um, Mr. Abakar, who's got 20 years of experience with running elections, he's pessimistic about the the fact that biometrics could biometric voter rolls could uh, resolve the potential conflicts. We end up with a lot of contestations, etc. And he's basically saying a point that's very important that it's better that we put our energy um, uh, into basically building a national population register, uh, civil register with a biometric uh, a- angle to it, similar to the South African uh, model, which is, is sort, of, sort of more, more mature. Um, I think this is an important point. Let us do an impromptu poll to see how the pulse 
of the audience is regarding this point. Do you really think um, these, these voter poll, voter registers with biometrics are wasteful or are they really useful? Let's, let's launch a poll because Mr. Abakar has really raised the controversial point, which is important. So let's look at, um, at, at the audience's view. What is your highest concern about using biometrics in elections? Um, you can say, I have no concern. You can say data protection and privacy concerns, exclusion and disenfranchisement um, of people distracts from the underlying political problems, which is what, what Mr. Abakar is saying, and also uh, say it's too expensive um, uh, and also undermines the electoral process if it fails. So this is a, a lengthy uh, poll. It basically says, I have no concern, there is data protection and privacy. There is exclusion and disenfranchisement possible. Uh, it distracts from the underlying political problems. It's too expensive. And then it undermines the political process when it fails. Let us see how the community is, is rallying around this issue. Um, Mr. Abakar, thank you so much. Uh, we would love to continue with you this discussion, but unfortunately we need to, we need to move on. I'll take uh, one more uh, community voice from Hatim, uh, but let me um, ask the operator, a fair warning, uh, three, two, one, and the poll. Okay, and while we're putting the poll uh, on, on, a, on a slide, so I will talk to Mr. Hatim and the operator, you'll tell me when the poll is ready. Um, Mr. Hatem, explain who you are and uh, state your purpose. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Beautiful. So, uh, Hatem, I'm uh, working for HSB Identification. Uh, we've been managing the, la the, the latest uh, elections in Chad, uh, what a coincidence. So, um, I wanted just to intervene on um, uh, a single point, if you allow me, actually. It's, uh, I've been on the field uh, managing uh, this, uh, these elections and the, the, the things that I have noticed, it's the lack of um, informations and also uh, the transfer of competences, which is almost um, doesn't exist in Africa. Uh, so we've been talking about technology and using technology, which is uh, amazing, which is, will be very helpful for our populations. But uh, I want to just raise this point, actually. When you work with the Commission Electorale Nationale uh, in the countries, you notice that the people doesn't exactly know what they are talking about, and we need absolutely to increase their knowledge. Uh, because what happening here in Europe or in the US has nothing to do with Africa. We're bringing technology to those countries, but we wanted just to make sure that we transfer competences. And every time we are delivering the technology, we need to train the people. And also, as I said, just to increase their knowledge. So this is exactly the point I wanted just Hattem, to raise in this. Hattem, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the point in terms of building capacity, but I was respectfully would like to point to you that some of the most expert electoral uh, people come from Africa. I mean, the four people that we put on the panel, each one of them has more than 20 years of experience. I, I, I challenge anybody around the world to come and back and tell us that they know more about elections, about these four people. Um, that does yeah. not mean that we should not be reinforcing the, the um, rank and file by creating capacity building exercises, but from a perspective of competence, I find the electoral commissions are very well versed in the subject because they've been pioneers in this area and our hat is off to them. Anyway, thank you, Hatim, for your point. Uh, operator, put up the, put up the poll, um, the poll that we just, we just uh, came up with. Um, the, basically, as you could see, we've got a situation that the community is completely, completely um, divided on this issue. There's no clear trend that is appearing. We have data protection and privacy as a big concern. Uh, people are concerned that it distracts from the underlying political problems. Um, not so many people think it's expensive. I think they're thinking that it, it is justifiable. Um, not so many people think it undermines when it fails, but I think um, uh, you could see 
the main areas are not concerned, data protection, privacy, and distracts from the underlying political problems. These are important insights. I think we are going to mull over them and think about them. And in the meantime, I would like to switch gears and move to the next panel. I thank, thank Tauna. We would love to have spent more time with you, but I'd like to move to the digital identity, digital data and disruption panel now. Thank you, thank you. Tauna, for the wonderful thank insight. You. Operator, could you please bring the, the, the panel? Okay, so um, I think we've got one more person missing on the panel, but while this person's getting on, I'd like to start with Amber. Amber, um, you know, we are moving in a world where digital identity is coming and digital identity in the form of a digital identifier, like a, an Aadhaar number, or Duma number, or something like this is becoming required for many things. And so basically um, I'd like to, get your perspective um, on India's experience. You've, you've studied the in, India's experience with elections, uh, with the use of Adhar, and whether it's positive or negative, um, give us a perspective of what happens when a digital identifier is added to the mix. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. I, I think uh, we have, in the poll that we just had, I think there weren't as many people who were concerned about the exclusionary question, but I think in India, our experience has been that that's uh, proven to be the biggest challenge in terms of, of trying to introduce a digital uh, aspect to our elections. So let me begin with clarifying that in India, we have a separate functional ID for the purpose of elections. We have an electoral voter card. Uh, that serves as the identity for electoral processes. Aadhaar is not really used for elections directly right now, but it plays a role. Uh, for instance, in, in our previous uh, national elections in 2019, the process of preparation of electoral roles involved deduplication of those roles using Aadhaar, and that led, and, and it was done in select states as a kind of experiment. And that led to fairly disastrous results in, in a lot of those places because a number of people were disenfranchised. So I think that uh, is, is the key question uh, in terms of how we introduce digital elements into our elections and what kind of uh, you know, ramifications that has for inclusivity. Uh, India has a strong history of, uh, you know, the election commission being the election management body, uh, and that has played a, a very important role in building the the, the confidence of, of the people in, in the democratic setup. And so particularly after the partition, there were a lot of migrants who came to, in, uh, to what is now the Indian uh, country from both Pakistan and Bangladesh. And electoral roles were set up on the basis of proof of identity and proof of address, which a lot of people did not have. And at that point, what we decided was it was most important for election to be inclusive. And uh, the, the sort of, there was a very responsive process undertaken by a small electoral management body at that point of time. Uh, in, in terms of allowing people to, at the end of the day, file affidavits and state where they wanted to reside, and also making the process of filing those affidavits, you know, cheaper, not with a lot of obstacles. And those are the kind of processes that led to building confidence in the electoral setup. And that, uh, a lot of that confidence uh, that has taken a long time to build, we saw the events of, of this nature that happened in the last election being squandered away because of the of the fairly callous manner in which people were disenfranchised. So I think that exclusion angle is something that we need to look at very carefully. There, there have been suggestions about uh, using Aadhaar for electoral purposes. Right now, there is a, a standing judgment on the digital ID scheme in India by the Indian Supreme Court. And under that scheme, it's not possible for Aadhaar to be used unless that, that position in the law changes in the future. But I, I, I personally have very strong reservations about, at this point of time, using digital ID in, in a, 
you know, within elections uh, because of the kind of problems that we're seeing, because of existing problems of exclusion that already exist within the Aadhaar setup. While I think the, the small opportunity within uh, the electoral management system for the use of digital ID is perhaps in uh, in the in the process in the run up to the elections when you need to re-register every time before an election, making those processes easier and, and introducing more ease and access to those platforms, I think that's and also as an addition to to the existing you know analog and physical systems that we have. So I really like the example that we discussed earlier from Guinea, where there were. Uh, in, in recognition of the exclusionary impact that digital ID can have, the need to have multiple backup options, the need to have, uh, and, and particularly in, in a country like India where there is so much mig uh, migration that happens on an everyday basis, people move from villages and rural India to cities. So the need for, for that sort of flexibility is extremely important. Okay, so Amber, um, what is wrong with the idea that we use the digital identity to make it more convenient for people instead of making it a requirement, make it a convenience. Do you think it's just by default, once we introduce it, governments are gonna basically make it a barrier, uh, a friction, and instead of making it a facilitator? Yeah, I think that's, uh, so we've, we've, over the last decade, we've gone through this entire debate uh, in terms of what, what happens in practice and what, what happens within regulation, the mandatory versus voluntary debate around Aadhaar. For a lot of, the, you know, despite there being laws, despite there being standing Supreme Court orders, uh, which prohibit from uh, Aadhaar from being made mandatory for various purposes, the, the truth on the ground has been that it is extremely difficult to get uh, your essential services, to even file a police complaint, to, to get a lot of benefits without being able to produce Aadhaar. So even if the regulation specifies it very clearly, uh, because the way Aadhaar has been portrayed as this foundational ID system, uh, supposedly you know, built on, on robust technology, which is free from errors, uh, it, the what might happen on the ground is that it becomes a very clear barrier to entry in a lot of these processes. So I think the the, and the key thing is that while we say that it is voluntary and not mandatory, we don't clearly specify that there are four other things that you're allowed to use. Uh, I think there are similar challenges that we faced within the pandemic also. First, with the contact tracing apps and now with the platform for vaccination. In, in both those cases, there are other ways in which you can uh, download both the co contact tracing apps and also register for vaccine using other forms of identifiers as well. But the default seems to have become Aadhaar. And even uh -huh. when you go to, uh, to get uh, your vaccine and everything, the first kind of ID that they ask for is Aadhaar. So it, my fear is much like it has happened in the case of, for instance, distribution of Russians and DBTs in India. With elections, if we do make it uh, even one of the IDs, it might pose uh, those kinds of exclusionary challenges. What we can do, like I was saying earlier, is uh, make it easier. Perhaps that can be used uh, to... Uh, you know, uh, to register yourself for elections, not to use yeah. as one of the IDs to vote itself, but the process of registering yourself within a district before the election, I think that's where it has a lot of potential. Okay, so so basically two, two lessons. One is we got to be vigilant to make sure the digital ID, which is coming, it's going to happen, is not going to become a barrier for disenfranchising, or it's not going to become a tool for disenfranchising people by accident or by intent. Uh, but also, I think the role of civil society, I mean, I think we ought to be vigilant to say to civil society, you have the ability in a democracy to bring in a case to say, look, you can't ask for this because the regulation says, the law says you cannot do it. And so even though de facto uh, it's happening, we have the power of the law, the law of the land to try to stop these practices from disenfranchising people. So do you think in India there is a civil society movement that's vigilant about this issue? Yes, I think the civil society movement around Aadhaar has been extremely vigilant for the past decade. The other challenge that we will face as we move forward, I think something uh, that you uh, alluded to briefly, Joseph, in, in your introductory uh, speech was 
how digital identifiers are then used uh, within the, the 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 sort of apparatus for micro targeting of voters with content with hate speech with misinformation in the run up to elections by political we're going to come back and we're going to come back to that. yeah the, the, this section we're going to discuss that okay that's great um so yeah pa- pause for a second i want to talk to um lucy and isaac and grace about another aspect of the digital world that we are living in which is basically the data i mean at the end of the day um we we generate data voter rolls are about data um and in the past um, all voter and uh, voter regulations required um the, the for transparency reasons publishing the voter rolls or sharing it with political parties and that is now in conflict with the with the with the privacy of people's data i mean this data could be very valuable because it could be used for other purposes uh, for targeting micro targeting etc so lucy where does privacy international stand on the issue of transparency of voter rolls thank you and um it's lovely to see amber and grace and isaac again cis and sipit are great friends of pi so it's lovely lovely to see you um yes thank you for the the question so this you know this question about the tension between privacy and transparency we hear a lot and in the electoral contest I, I would say that there isn't a conflict in fact i mean there's an interaction definitely but actually there are there are ways that data protection in particular can assist with transparency and also as we're getting into a point where electoral laws are needing to be updated for the digital age data protection and data protection authorities are an area which can really help with that um so you know we hear with the kind of this tension it's normally in two areas it's either the voter register being available or it's the publication of the voter lists in polling mm-hmm. stations so if i take the voter register first you know the voter register it's you know p- political parties have a legitimate interest in seeing that um, yeah. it should be shared among them but then there should also be limits on who accesses that and that is something that data protection definitely can help with there's also kind of going back even further step what kind of information is collected to go on the register in the first place is it necessary to for example to have ethnicity to identify you know a, a the a, a voter um so there's kind of all these things where even going back to data protection will help with that and so we can put limits on who 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 the date the voter register is shared with and my colleagues from Kenya talk a lot about that because they've done lots of research in in the past about it and you know we it's I, I really like the description from the ICO in the UK which is our data protection authority that the voter register is the spine on which all other information is built when it when it comes to um political campaigning and targeting so it's a really important piece of information to protect it's the core of the democratic engagement and it's the core piece that we need to protect uh, we still need to give legitimate access uh to the to the to the voter rolls to the world and and we still i mean you, you you're basically saying let's make sure not everybody gets it but also um data minimization uh, so um isaac and grace where do you guys stand from an african perspective on this you've seen the laws in in on the continent they all require you to publish it so so w- where are we heading in this regard i i leave it to the tandem between the two of you to decide how to take the question grace and i had decided i would take this question so Okay. Uh, you know i can tell you where kenya is headed and it's okay. uh, it was mentioned before and that's that's the huduma number which is the the foundational id and uh functional id in in one system a centralized system and a lot of information is being collected for that and it is a re- it, according to the draft laws at least it will be uh a requirement for voting so it essentially becomes the voter register now to interrogate that voter register uh you either have to pick out very specific data or give the whole thing in which case a whole lot of extra information goes with it so when they uh re- were registering people for who do a number they were asking about education about marital status about agricultural activities uh land issues a lot of things that have absolutely nothing to do with voting and so it's to to segregate that data is 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 really important whether it'll be possible or or done is is definitely an open question isaac and- i i need I, i this is not what i heard from from michael what michael basically said even in the 2022 the huduma number is not going to be ready but what well, i understood 
let, let me just finish. What I understood from Michael was that they, they would use the Huduma number available to attest, to validate, to help them basically establish that this person exists, et cetera. But it doesn't mean that they're going to care about all the other fields. Uh, perhaps the voter role that's constituted by the IEBC would have a very uh, limited set of information. Um, actually, operator, if you want to bring in, uh, check with uh, check with Michael if he wants to come in. But the, the point is that while Huduma number and the National Population Register contains a lot more information, doesn't necessarily mean that the voter register is the full set of data. It could be a subset based on what is rele relevant to, to voting. You have a very legitimate point in saying we need to minimize what's relevant to voting. But I'm not sure that that's the plan. The plan is not to... I mean, because these are even two organizations that are very different. You've got, you know, the, the ministry that runs the, the National Population Register and then the commission that runs the, the voter roll. Is there something that you know that we don't know? <laughs> well, Dr. Actic, I hadn't quite finished what I was going to say, but let me respond. Please go ahead. <laughs> let, me, let me respond very directly to what you just said. First of all, we don't know because uh, the Huduma number is still in the process of being developed in terms of the, the legal framework. We, had, we have right. a bill which says it'll be a requirement for voting. We don't really know, at least the public doesn't know, maybe the government does know where they're heading, but we don't, uh, in terms of what it will be used for and how it will be used for voting. My, my, my larger point though was, was actually to, to take this in a, a slightly different direction. Um, and that is uh, something that nobody yet has discussed is, um, is security in the sense that we can guarantee you there will be data breaches. There are always data breaches. You can never guarantee there won't be data breaches. Israel, UK, India, they've all had data breaches in, in identity information. So there will be a very big threat. There will be data breaches for, for these systems. The, the issue I wanna bring in is gender. And that is, um, we, the Amnesty International just released a, a, a report that showed that a much larger percentage of men felt that they understood and appreciated the right of privacy. And a much larger percentage of men knew about the Data Protection Act in Kenya. So women actually knew about it less, knew, knew about their right to privacy less, knew about the protections that they had less. When you have combined your voter registration with other information that might be gender specific farming things, uh, marital status, that sort of thing. The risk I see, the risk of disenfranchising in this case is women will be more likely to be uh, suspicious of the system that is being enacted or, or being used. And therefore uh, the, it, it, it becomes a very difficult situation in terms of getting people to know the rights that they have and then being secure and confident with the systems that are in place. I understand. I understand. But, but let's be careful that we, we uh, understand how Huduma number in the future would be used in constituting the voter register. Maybe, Michael, you can give us a vision for how that is, because that's your concern, Isaac, is absolutely valid, but it's not what I understood uh, from the IEBC is what they intend to do. Michael, do you want to share this conversation? Uh, yes. Uh, first, I would like to agree with the, what uh, Dr. Rutenberg is saying about data protection concerns. Indeed, there's a Data Protection Act currently in Kenya, and uh, the implementation and uh, uh, the implementation of it is another matter I wouldn't like to get into, but it is a genuine concern. To clarify, the use uh, IBC would use for electoral purposes, it is the same as we do now. We use the ID to get the date of birth, the full names, the gender, uh, the where where the person was born, and all this for proof of citizenship. That is all. The role of the electoral commission is then to assign a citizen to a voting station. That's all we need to do. Now, with the development of biometrics, then we also needed to collect biometric data and uh, portrait. This was only necessary because of the fact that the national registry didn't have this data. So we are saying 
in case the national registry already has those uh, data, we only need to query to get what we need for, they keep the biometrics, they keep the portraits, how they store and keep them will be subject to Data Protection Act, uh, which will, will be addressed different by the courts. But for the purposes of elections, we still need just the date of birth, uh, the basic bi biographical data to uh, enable us to assign voters to uh, polling stations, that is all. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, you're, you, I think your concerns are, are, are noted, important, and we need to keep it in track. But I think we also need to understand uh, the reality of what is intended to be done. Uh, so I, at least this is what I had understood from the IABC, which sounds sounds legitimate. You have a national population register, contains other data. Uh, you, you interrogate it to get what you need and no more than what you need. I think this is what the data protection laws should be uh, in, in place to do that. Okay, so, um, okay. So is there any, anything about, about this tension between transparency and privacy that we should address further? Or can I move on to another important topic, which is the micro-targeting? Um, I mean, we, we believe that there is going to be a need to publish the, the a redacted version of the, of the, poll, of the polls. Uh, anybody on the panel feels that there is an alternative to that? redacted polls, uh, redacted voter lists that we can publish so that we can allow the political parties to, to um, essentially validate that, yes, this is legitimate, and it's not filled with, with fake votes, uh, fake voters. Um, okay, so, but that takes us to another, another topic, which is at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if now the political parties have access to voter rolls, other data, maybe telephone records, maybe other data. The aggregation of data can result in the production of profiles. Now we're not talking about identity, we're talking about profiled identity, and this is all enabled by digital identity. Now, as I explained in my opening remarks, this can lead to micro-targeting or the delivery of different messages to different people. So let me ask the panel, uh, all of you, anybody that wants just raise your hand, let me know. Do you think we should worry about the negative effect of micro-targeting on the electoral process? Micro-targeting, which is enabled by two things, digital identity with enriched by profiles, plus platforms, social media platforms. Is this a problem or is this too much? Uh, much ado about nothing. So anybody wants to address this issue, the impact of micro-targeting on the democratic process. Uh, Lucy, and then I wanna hear from Rick. Yes, it is, uh, it is a, prob an, a, a problem. And, um, you know, the micro-targeting, whether it's political or commercial is kind of the same. You know, there's, uh, there's, um, there's a lot of problems. So it's just that in the political sphere, the harms might be greater because now we're talking about democratic participation. But if we can kind of roll back a little bit to the beginning about the sources of data, you know, actually it's a global problem it's not just a problem for one country or one region right. you know, data collection is gratuitous and out of control full stop and this is why yep. data collection is so important now when you look at the kind of information that's used in micro-targeting the voter register is the source it's the main source which is why i was saying that this is something that really does need to be protected yes it, there's a legitimate interest for political parties to have access to it but when they start losing control of that when it's not clear but either by legal framework or other means, what you know, what their responsibilities are and who they are and aren't allowed to share it with, there's a real problem there. Because what happens is that in political campaigning, political parties will outsource that, um, those right. companies to other companies, and then you start to lose visibility of this data. And this is a real problem for us as, as citizens, is now we're losing track of who has our data and what they're using it for. If you talk about undermining trust in the electoral process, this, this is it. Once we start saying, well, who has my data? Who, why, why am I seeing this message? Why am I being targeted by this? Then everything comes undone. Right. And it's a complex issue. But if you roll back to the beginning, if you roll back to the voter register and data collection in the first place, if you get that right, which data protection can really help with, then these other problems of profiling don't become so serious because without the data, 
the profiling is not as good or accurate or as dangerous. So I really want to stress that, you know, this this kind of pitting privacy against transparency in this context is not it's not a thing. You know, there, there really is there's an interaction there where data protection can really build trust in the electoral process. Now, we can kind of go further down into the political campaigning and, and the complexities of it. But I really want to stress that point that right at the beginning, there is something that we can all do. Legal framework, electoral management bodies, you know, electoral laws being updated for the, for the digital age. This is where it starts. OK, so let me let me take one further dimension and, 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 and dedicate maybe to Grace this time and Isaac. Um, basically, um, still on the subject of micro-targeting, we're looking at the idea that now platforms are able to do something much more powerful than broadcasting using a digital identity that's profiled. They deliver different messages to different people. And as a result, um, basically you can you can spread lies, you can spread misinformation because you don't have to be transparent by in front of everybody. You can just target the weaknesses of certain communities, et cetera. Now, do you think, uh, Grace and Isaac, do you think we are at a point where we really need um, new regulations for fair information practices like we used to see in Reg FD, like I mentioned in my opening remarks? And if, the, if, it, if this is the case, what, what uh, form do these regulations need to take? What kind of regulations are we looking for? Um, yeah, thank you. Let me take that. I'd say that um, in the case of African countries like Kenya, um, and, and this is just to take you back just a little, um, there is also an aspect of uh, micro-targeting that can happen through digital ID especially where you don't have a uh, separation between um, the state agency that is uh, in charge of uh, ID management and uh, the political parties. Uh, and so we've seen instances where political parties are able to obtain uh, very granular information uh, that helps them in micro-targeting from, um, from, from the digital ID uh, database. And so even as countries are you know, putting in place all these uh, sophisticated digital ID systems, there's a need to have a separation and for the laws to be very clear on that um, the, the states or the, the body that is in charge of digital ID is completely separate from the political uh, processes, even if the administration is, is, is the same as the political party in power. And, um, and then uh, now directly to your question on, on, on the platforms, uh, it is true that uh, platforms um, have also become quite important in political campaigning. And um, here we also, uh, on top of platforms, we also have you know, the mobile uh, networks um, because you know, um, the, the, there's also an interest in targeting especially rural and, and, and voters who do not necessarily get all their information online. And um, even using um, uh, data such as ethnicity, markers such as ethnicity, um, for example, in 2017 in Kenya and in many other places in Africa, you've seen uh, this kind of micro-targeting. Um, while I agree with the uh, participants who are saying that you know, propaganda has been around for centuries, I think that the skill uh, with which this can happen uh, calls on us to, um, to, to, to adopt our election campaign um, uh, rules to uh, address this kind of, um, this, this kind of targeting. I mean, surely if, if, you, if, you, if you do, for example, an automated uh, call to my mother in the village uh, with maybe the, the, the voice of the president, she will definitely be so excited and, and, and um, will become a campaigner for, 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 the, for that political party. So there's definitely a need to relook at our laws and to, um, to have the campaign laws um, uh, respond to the issues of the day, which include um, unfair information practices such as uh, micro-targeting, which can happen at so many levels uh, using all these databases. Right, okay. Amber, you, you raised your hand. You wanted to, to say something. 
Yes, I mean, I just wanted to kind of add a little bit to what uh, both Grace and Lucy mentioned. So the problem doesn't just end at the digital, in terms of political profiles being created based on, on the digital ID that is in place. So there is the digital identity management body. And then there is an entire ecosystem of data generation that happens yeah. around it, right? So that, that's where the, the, the profiles are created from. So what we've seen in India, for instance, has been the, uh, the, the because of a lack of data protection law, uh, much of the, uh, the profiles that are created through social welfare schemes, much of that data is freely available. It's, uh, there is hardly any regulation for uh, public bodies sharing data in the country right now. And that leads to very, very granular profile. And more than I think it being mixed with social media profiles, because uh, that's not the, while there are more and more people coming online in, in a lot of countries, what we are seeing uh, is, is, is kind of using the profiles from social welfare schemes and then mixing it with insights that political actors get from, from their on-ground campaigns. So as opposed to the West, where there is a lot of reliance on, uh, you know, for instance, social media profiles, personality tests that people take online. Here, I think based on, on sort of on-ground insights that you have about communities in, in a place like India on class and caste lines, for instance, and then there is mixing of a lot of data that leads to fairly sophisticated uh, kind of micro-targeting. Okay, so uh, Isaac, I I want to um, understand your perspective from sort of a legal point of view, looking at distinguishing different information platforms. An information platform, which is a broadcast, where in the past propaganda used to pass by broadcast, so we can hear it, we, everybody would receive it. Radio, nobody can stop radio waves. There was no micro targeting. There's no micro targeting from from. Uh, broadcast in, in general. And then platforms that are now use identity to modify the message, etc. And as you know, um, Africa has, has been adopting the um, de uh, Communication Decency Act, uh, the safe harbors, that, that analog of the safe harbors like uh, Article 230, which basically protected these platforms and treated them all as information dissemination platforms. Do we need to start distinguishing between platforms that broadcast and platforms that use um, micro-targeting and therefore start to bring a different kind of safe harbor or, or remove safe harbor from them? What, what do you think? Beyond the elections, I mean, elections is one element where these are being used to manipulate, but what do you think in general? Well, I think the United States has, has come to realize that Section 230 uh, that, that gives a blanket safe harbor is, is maybe not the best way to, to run the internet. Um, interestingly, uh, Kenya just adopted within the last two years, the same safe harbor provision. So it took us 20 years to implement something that, that maybe seemed like a good idea at the time, 20 years ago, maybe it, I mean, well, it undoubtedly it did build the internet that we have today. Um, we, we would not be where we are without that section. Um, but, but we've seen now what happened, the ultimate outcome of that. And, uh, you know, should, should we start to implement that now here today, uh, the, the, the safe harbor, blank, blanket safe harbor, or should we go in the direction that the United States is going with, which, with, which means, you know, assigning a, well, attempting to assign a bit more, um, responsibility. Well, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think that uh, every every country has to make their own uh, independent decision based on a lot of factors, such as the technologies that that they have. Their, you know, the technologies, the political situations, the um, potential for sort of the disruptive technologies that that were that were born out of of that sort of a of a thing, and whether that's relevant to them. But um, but I think we we should definitely not ignore. Um, the, the the signs that that are that are pretty loud right now that that that's that sort of a framework is is maybe not the best um, for for, for uh, legitimate discourse. Right. So I think we need to revisit that topic uh, basically and 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 think about the impact of digital identity on how information flows. We usually think information 
is information. It flows irrespective of who's receiving it. But now we're realizing that that is not the case. I mean, if we can target by changing what the message is, now you are doing an editorial. You're now, you're no longer saying, I've got no liability. You're no longer saying I'm neutral, etc. So I think this is an important topic. Let's keep it as a placeholder for the future to come back to that. Um, but there's another dimension that I'd like to bring Vincent in, in on, which is Vincent, um, I, I think ba basically when we look at, at, the, um, at the way data, um, there's data from the voter rolls, but there's also data coming in from the, from the polling stations themselves. And we can get a lot of insights. And in fact, you know, we used to think about um, basically the uh, the secret ballot. It used to be that I would place my vote and they would not be able to tell what I voted. But it seems that with such granularity, with such amount of data, they could start guessing um, what what is my, my voting, what did I vote, what is the probability that I voted in a certain manner. How do we um, bring back the, the secret ballot while at the same time allow us to create a dimension of verifiability that I can verify that my, my vote was really counted the right way and the accountability of the process. Is there any new technology? I mean, should we be talking about uh, blockchains? Our blockchains have something to do with this in the future. So uh, uh, blockchains, they, they probably have, have a role to play uh, in this and, and, and we're talking about how can technology support the, uh, the 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 essential properties that we want for for our voting system, right? Uh, so blockchain presents, in principles, in its core principles, interesting uh, properties such as uh, the trust by consensus uh, principle, which is uh, quite natural for for election systems. Uh, its distributed nature uh, uh, brings a lot of resilience, uh, with regards to attacks or, um, some part of the infrastructure, uh, breaking down, uh, and the, at the core of it, the integrity of the data is something extremely useful in the sense that no one, uh, um, if you consider the principle of it, no one, no matter what the, the, the privilege, the access that he has to the data can, uh, potentially alter the data without anyone noticing. That's a very interesting property, but, uh, as of itself, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me for a second. Uh, okay, um, it, it doesn't really uh, bring another couple of properties uh, by design that are very important for election system. The first one, obviously, is, is confidentiality of the vote, right? And anonymity of the voter, right? You you don't want to have that connection between the the vote that is expressed in the ballot and the voter that uh, expressed the ballot. So that's something that you need to cut. In the in the most uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, fundamental way, uh, that link between the voter and the vote, uh, as soon as you have uh, um, achieved verification of that the, the the person has the right to vote. So we've been we've been uh, um, elaborating on that, uh, and obviously we are not uh, um, professionals of of uh, election systems of election theory, if you will. So we. We've partnered with a French uh, university laboratory called Loria. They are um, experts in the field, worldwide recognized uh, experts in the field. And, and I'm really talking about a research project that we are collaborating on. I'm not talking about a product or a solution that we intend to bring to market. We're really talking about trying to advance uh, uh, the state of the art of, of election technology, really. Um, it's about, so we gave them, a, 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 we challenged the Loria with a number of, of, uh, of um, requirements. We want, so we, we wanted to work on in-person voting. The reason for that is, and call me old fashioned, but I still consider that picking the next president for my country is maybe something I do not want to do between two Facebook posts. That, 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 that's kind of a ritual that the nation comes together to perform. So we, we I'm not disparaging uh, online voting, but we really wanted to focus on in-person voting, physical physical voting in polling stations. Um, we also told them they wouldn't have printers, uh, all the kind of, of equipment that get break down usually in, a, in the course of an election day. And we, we gave them two additional very important uh, um, uh, requirements. The first one obviously is, is vote confidentiality, but that's, that's at the core of any given election system. Uh, but also we wanted to have the in famous cast as intended property, in the sense that we wanted online voters, uh, no, sorry, not online, voters 
to be able to verify for themselves and for, and for themselves only that the vote they had just cast has been cast as they intended. It's a very difficult property to get with a technology system, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, because, because, they, because of the black box nature of these complex Next. systems, and even voter user will, will have a hard time verifying that for himself. I'm just clicking on a button and hoping for the best. Um, so uh, uh, the, the, the uh, state of the art for that is called the Benalo test. It, it is where a defiant voter or a suspecting voter will take his ballot and go for an audit saying, I want to make sure that what's in that ballot corresponds to yeah. what I voted for. And the usual way to do this is to open the ballot and for the user to verify that, that it is indeed his vote. So it breaks the ballot. The ballot is, has now become invalid. Mm -hmm. It somehow breaks confidentiality of the vote in the sense that uh, um, uh, because the ballot was open, somebody could have, could have looked at it. So this is the challenge that we've, both, that we've uh, faced Loria with and they come back to us with what is still a prototype protocol, um, uh, which addresses these uh, issues with the help of a technology that we've been developing, which is uh, smart cards with a, an electronic ink display on them. We are still facing a lot of difficulties with this, with this, prob with this project. Uh, usability is one, definitely. But what we've successfully done, what they have successfully done is making sure that we could audit every ballot without destroying or opening the ballot. And that's a very important thing. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, say one, one last thing. You probably all remember Dieselgate. That's when the cars that were being assessed for pollution actually knew that they were being assessed for pollution. Yeah. They were having a different set of parameters so that they would be yeah. clean. And as soon as they were back on the road, they would start polluting the way they were not supposed to, right? So mm -hmm. if a system can be aware that it is being audited, it can behave differently from what he would do if he wasn't being audited. And yeah. this is something we have built in the protocol in the sense that every single ballot will be audited. And because it does not destroy the ballot, because it does not uh, reveal the content of the ballot, then every single ballot can be audited so that you would have um, um, uh, accountability on the counting of the ballot, which would be in theory, and that's all theory for the moment, 100% uh, um, guaranteed. So that's what we're working on. I'm sorry, I can't get into more details about this. Problem. No, no, I mean, this, this is actually a positive view. We're looking forward to these kind of innovations right. that use cutting edge technology to actually remove, move away from mystery and help people restore the trust. I see Isaac and Lucy raise your hands. Isaac, step in please, and then Lucy. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, just on that very issue, I wanted to give the, the example of the 2017 election and I'm not advocating for or against the use of technology, but giving an example of what happened. Um, there was a dispute about of the, the election was disputed, as you know, uh, the, the parties filed lawsuit at the Supreme Court, and one of the parties filed 58 pages of server logs uh, to show, and their, 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 their contention was that the server was hacked. And, you know, reading 58 pages of server logs, if you've ever seen those, it's garbage if you don't know what it means. It's, it's gobbledygook. So um, they were able to uh, essentially plant the, the seed of doubt that way. But yeah. you know, we, we actually got experts to look at it. There was there was no evidence that that the IEBC servers were, were hacked that way, the, as it was being contended. But the, the 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 problem was that the judges or the courts couldn't deter, couldn't tell that, and they were there was enough doubt that they actually right. annulled the election. So, you know, weaponizing technology for people That's who don't problem. understand it, it is a real problem. That, that, that is, in fact, the problem. It happened in the U.S. I mean, reasonable people, having listened to certain political figures claiming that the elections were stolen, started to believe that the elections were stolen. When, when all the evidence pointed to there's no support for that claim. I mean, th this is the problem. And, 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 and in, in many cases, it came down to people saying, well, the machine is, is such a, you know, a black box device. I don't know what happened. It was Chavez people that, that changed what was inside it, et cetera. That, that's why in the US, all those claims had to be resolved to the reasonable 
extent to to the to the to the standard of reasonable reasonable people by hand counting the ballots, which in many cases took two, three, four weeks in order for count and recount and recount. And so, in any case. I think even with the use of technology, I think we're going to be still for a very, very long time, still using old fashioned physical ballots. And thank goodness that's a receipt that we should hang on to. Um, Lucy. You're muted. That was the point that I was also going to make that whenever I hear blockchain mentioned, I get extremely nervous, especially in this context where, you know, like you say, there is almost well, so much misunderstanding about the technology we already have that into that vacuum, it is right. so easy for politicians to shut to so distress. And, you know, Isaac raised the, the that example of 2017 in Kenya very well. And I, I feel like we're, we're kind of building technology on top of problems that maybe aren't technical, and that is going to cause a real problem. So, you know, secrecy of the ballot, you know, blockchain isn't going to solve intimidation at the, you know, outside the polling station, which is a huge problem in a lot of areas. And I just think, like, you know, like you said, Vincent, blockchain isn't just about clicking a button and everyone can see what's on the blockchain. It, it takes a lot for people to kind of get on board with that. And, and even we're, we're struggling with the technology that we already have, even in terms of biometric voter registration for people. And I would just really kind of go like, oh, <laughs> let's just hold, hold yeah. on to it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're entering a new world and a new world where data and digital identity are basically being exploited and could potentially be exploited. But also our countermeasures are becoming more sophisticated that the average person's way over their head that they cannot really follow. And in which case, uh, any manipulation, any weaponizing can become very easy by saying to people, you know, this is a very mysterious process and anything can happen. So I think I think we... we the issues are are now at the table, and we need we need to be looking for the right balance of 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 policies, the right balance of regulations, with also the use of technologies. I mean, we have to admit that in in many cases in Africa, the use of biometric technology has helped in 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 bringing in some sort of legitimacy. Um, in fact, if you look at the post-election violence, it used to be one in four elections before biometrics used to be actually contested and led to serious violence. I don't think one in four are leading to uh, election violence in Africa right now. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, it would be very hard to imagine that that would be the case. Um, actually, um, operator, there is one poll that I wanted to do. Um, bring in, bring in uh, the the um, also the CV, the community voice, the one last community voice, and then prepare the final panel, which will be a short one. Um, so, um, actually, just to finish this this topic, which is not really uh, we, we have not gotten our arms around it. We just raised the su the subject. I want to get the pulse of the community about this. Operator, could you please put up the, the last poll to get the community on this very topic? Okay, so now we're looking at digital disruption. The question is, how do you think digital disruption would impact the democratic process by 2030? Um, some people think it will lead to better democracy. Some people believe it will undermine it. Some people believe basically it will have no impact. So we will just adapt and, and, and live with it. Uh, going forward. So um, let's just, just make this very quick. Okay. Um, let me give you a fair warning. So fair warning, um, three, two, one, end the poll, please. Okay. So basically, um, we are seeing that people believe that digital disruption would lead to a better 52%. Uh, it will undermine it, 29%, uh, and 19%, it will have no impact. So here is the, the slide for um, the YouTube uh, for your reference. Okay, so unfortunately, we, we're running out of time, so we won't be able to... Um, to keep this interesting panel going. I'd like to bring in whoever is left from the electoral management bodies. Uh, operator, please bring them on. While at the same time, Ola, Ola Gide, uh, could you please introduce yourself from where you are and state your purpose while we wait for the other panelists to come back? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Atit. Uh, my name is Ola Olajide. 
I'm founder of Grassroots Sustainable Energy Advocate Team in The Hague, uh, in Netherlands. I'm in Nigeria in the uh, diaspora. Uh, my concern uh, throughout, I have been listening to uh, the idea of uh, ID for Africa, and I, I, I applaud it, uh, and I've been following uh, the uh, program uh, very closely because it's very close to my heart because I'm also a documentalist uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands and uh, I follow uh, the election uh, process uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, very, very closely. And, uh, and also uh, what is happening uh, in, our, in my own uh, grassroots uh, back home uh, we all know that uh, most Africa set up uh, is a uh, minim uh, minimalist uh, dem democracy, and uh, therefore there is no uh, proper documentation uh, as it's supposed uh, to uh, as to compare it to the Western world, and uh, to see that uh, even in the uh, in the Western world uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, digitalization uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, electra uh, board is not even uh, feasible right now and i know that uh, okay africa is still uh, in uh, in a way uh, struggling with even having a civil registration and proper design and implementation of my national identity management. So uh, my concern is about the people at the grassroots because uh, we uh, people back there, they even have to uh, encourage them to vote, especially women. They have to uh, even uh, resort to uh, like last election in uh, Nigeria. They even I have to be giving money to beg people to go and uh, vote. So I don't know how we, uh, we can uh, do uh, uh, online uh, registration and uh, to support uh, voters and uh, how to build a sustainable uh, program uh, compared to the Western uh, world that can actually uh, make uh, things to work. Because uh, like uh, you said, uh, yeah, Ola, we, we lost you, but but thank you. Thank you for the comments. I think um, the sustainability and also the the connecting what the electoral commissions are doing today to the future is a very, very important topic. And that's precisely what I'd like to have a closing remarks um, from our panelists. Basically, you know, where do you think the electoral management bodies are heading? I mean, you've got forces from the inside you're, you're able to manage them. You've managed them for the last 20 years, and now there are forces on the outside. Um, are you simply having to hunker down and focus on the very next election um, and so that you can really get it done? Or do you think you have the ability to look forward to a sustainability to, uh, to the future of elections? Uh, Chidi, share with us your, your philosophical perspective of, of where you're heading. Okay, thank you so much. Um... For us in Nigeria, and for me particularly, I know that when election is very transparent, the people get involved, the people will begin to know that their vote counts. So in Africa, it hasn't been easy. So if we develop this system to make the vote count, I think the populace and the voters will embrace not only the system, but even the commission. Uh, with my experience in Nigeria, I noticed that there are times Nigerians celebrate for a good election. There are times they say this election is not good. And therefore, once the election needs to be credible and that the vote counts and it's very transparent, no matter who wins, they will be happy. And for you to reach there, you must start from a good voter registration because of the peculiarity of, this, of Africa. If you finish voter registration, the next thing which technology comes in is how do you identify and how do you accredit or how do you authenticate the person that came to vote? Because we don't have this foundation, we don't know who he is, we're just there. Nigeria is building up. Nigeria is also building up to have that NIMSI or 
foundation ID card, you must know that the person that comes to vote is the person that registered. After that, another issue which will come is, after the election, please transmit that result from the polling unit. Once you do that, all the issues concerning not believing on the electoral system will begin to reduce. So identity is playing a big part in voter registration. Identity okay. is playing a big part, a big, uh, a big job in that creation. So that's a future. My sister from Netherlands will tell you with time we'll get there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Michael, could you share with us your perspective about the future? Uh, thank you. Uh, I've, I, I foresee more and more investment in technology. Uh, some talking about going uh, e-voting and all. But I'm not sure it will, uh, it will bring a uh, commensurate increase in credibility because uh, many countries have invested so much in technology without uh, a proportionate increase in credibility in election. There are still other underlying problems. But uh, on the other hand, technology has helped greatly with the, for example, the speed of registration of voters processing the register, ensuring unique, uh, unique identification of voters, uh, increased efficiency, especially during polling, but a lot still needs to be done, especially on education of the public. We should not leave everything to technology. I think some problems are uh, endemic within the country, things political, not, nothing to do with technology. We should not leave everything to technology. Legislation must address some of the problems, deterrence to voter fraud and all that. Uh, the judicial system has to work to, to increase the trust in the electoral process. Uh, lastly, with the increased investment in technology, and every, every cycle, people need more on technology. I think we are going to face a problem with the electronic waste in the future, especially if you stay with the equipment too long so that they cannot even be passed to children in school, for example. Those are major issues that are going to face, especially with the lithium ion batteries, which many electoral commissions have in their warehouses and stuff. So those are what I can contribute at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael, very much. Um, Madam Kamara? Merci beaucoup. Je pense que... Vous m'entendez? Oui, oui, tout à fait. Je pense que, de mon avis, euh, La biométrie et l'identification ou l'utilisation de la technologie est un élément de transparence, est un élément de confiance dans la conduite des processus électoraux en Afrique et par le monde d'ailleurs. Um, I believe that, so thank you very much, and I believe that bio, biometrics and uh, new technologies uh, will help with the transparency and the trust in Africa and other countries. Mais ceci ne constitue pas l'apanage de la confiance ni de la transparence dans les élections. But uh, this is not the only element of uh, the trust and um, transparency in elections. Pour moi, pour que la confiance réside dans le processus démocratique dans un pays, il faut mettre les institutions fortes. In my opinion, for trust in democracy in a country, we need strong institutions. Il faut élaborer des textes de loi qui garantissent euh, le droit de vote et qui garantissent la transparence dans l'ensemble des processus démocratiques. We need to guarantee laws and uh, texts of laws that will guarantee the transparency and the democratic processes. Et il faut créer l'indépendance des organisateurs des élections, leur donner le pouvoir d'agir pleinement lorsqu'ils sont dans leur rôle et dans leur mission 
euh, de crédibiliser les élections. And organizers have to be independent organizations that have the power to give credibility to the electoral processes. Pour moi, ces éléments vont aider l'Afrique. In my opinion, ah, these elements will help Africa. Ça, son processus démocratique, mais également permettre aussi aux citoyens d'avoir confiance au, au processus électoral. So it will allow Africa to enroll its uh, democracy, uh, but also for the populations to trust uh, the different uh, processes. Tel, sont, okay. euh, tel est mon avis et je pense que nous allons continuer dans ce sens et pourvu que les institutions euh, d'organisation des élections, les OGE durent à, en Afrique. So this is uh, what I think, and this is, I believe, the direction that we are taking as long as the EMB uh, will continue to act in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Kamara. And I'd like to um, thank all of the panelists who stayed with us till the end. We'll get a chance to say goodbye. But I actually just want to quickly sum up, as you could see, trust in elections is one of the most sensitive and delicate topics that is very complex. It's not one magic bullet that will solve the problem. There are many layers uh, to, the, to the, the issue and the challenges are just emerging all the time, especially with the digital disruption. There are territories that we do not know where we're heading. I think the legislation, the legislators are lagging behind. Uh, the technology in some cases is running ahead. But as we all agree, this is not going to be a technological solution. It's going to require the right Uh, political will and the right um, legal frameworks to make sure that one person, one vote with inclusive access, everybody has the right, and but also that people are able to make up their mind and make up their decisions with free will. The free will in elections is one of the most important elements. And what bothers me about digital identity sometimes is that when it's exploited to rob me of my free will, whether it is in, in a commercial context when somebody is trying to convince me to buy something or when somebody is trying to dupe me or convince me to vote for something or somebody not based on my free will. And, and so this brings us, brings us to really an important um, juncture, which I hope we will come back to um, as we continue our ID for Africa deliberations with our community. Um, as you as you've heard, uh, we will be uh, uh, off for a couple of months um, from the live cast so we can focus on other projects with direct engagement with the, with the African community and so that we can prepare the ID for D agenda and also our program for next year. But I expect that this topic of digital disruption and its impact on society, not just in Africa, but in the whole world, will continue to be a topic of, um, of relevance and interest. I hope you've enjoyed um, the episodes this year, second season of uh, Livecasts. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we've produced 18 episodes together, so I encourage you to go on to the uh, replay on, on YouTube. But also, I, I thank all of the panelists uh, who joined us, not just today, but also uh, throughout the last year uh, and helped us produce quality content. Uh, clearly, the topics are very challenging and very complex. And I think the discussion has been very intense. So thank you so much. And here I can say, um, until we meet again, um, please stay safe and uh, continue to engage with us through the other mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. See Thank you next you. time. Thank you, Doc.